Hello, Matrix. Um, I'm here to help you with your physics paper. It's paper one. Okay, so all physics papers will consist of 65 marks of Newton's laws and applications of Newton's laws. That is grade 11 work, um, momentum and impulse, vertical projectile motion, and work energy power. That will be 65 out of the 150. Then you've got wave sound and light, which is Doppler effect, which is 15 marks. You've got electrostatics and electric circuits, which again is grade 11 work, and then electrodynamics, which is the motor and the generator, that's 55 marks. And then your last 15 is photoelectric effect. Okay, so your paper one physics will be written on a Friday from nine until 12 in the morning, three hours, 150 marks, with 20 marks that are multiple choice questions and the structured questions make up the rest of the 130 marks. Question one is always 10 multiple choice questions. There are two marks each, so that's 20 marks. Then from question two onwards, it's the longer questions, the definitions, the free body diagrams, the calculations. And you need to number your questions as they are numbered in the exam paper. Even if the numbering doesn't make sense or you think that it's wrong, you must number it as it is numbered in the question paper. The markers will pick up on any problems when they're marking. Your physics final paper will consist of 10 multiple choice questions, which is question 1, 1.1 to 1.10. There's Newton's laws and applications, which is question 2, and that is actually grade 11 work. Then question 3 is vertical projectile motion in one dimension. Question 4 will be momentum and impulse. Question 5 will be work energy and power. Question 6 is Doppler effect. Question 7 is electrostatics, question 8 is electric circuits, question 9 is electrodynamics, and question 10 will be the photoelectric effect. Okay, so this is your formula sheet. This is actually a very important piece of your exam, and I would suggest you try and make sure that you understand what all of these constants are, or at least have this page with you while you write your exams, so that if you come across a variable that you're not familiar with on the formula sheet, you just come and check on this guy whether you can see the letter that you can't figure out is not maybe just sitting on these constants. The other useful thing for this set of information is that it can actually give you the units. So, for example, the universal gravitational constant, this one over here, you can use it with the formula, so the formula looks like this. It's got that F is equal to G M1 M2 over R squared. And you've probably been told a million times what the units are for each of these things. But if you look at the universal gravitational constant, which is here, if you look at that thing's units, you can see Newtons, which is for the force. You can see meters squared, which is for the radius squared at the bottom, or the distance between the two centers. And you can see kilograms to the minus two, which means your masses need to be in kilograms. The constants can give you clues as to what the unit should be. Don't forget your units and use your formula sheet. So you can see on here, distances must be in meters. They must be in meters, they must be in meters. The unit for acceleration is meters per second squared. You don't need to remember it, but you do need to remember where you can find it. Coulomb's constant is, comes from a similar formula, and it tells you similar things, because often you forget what must these units be in. This formula tells you newtons for the force, meters for the distance between the centers, and coulombs for the charges. Not nanocoulombs, not microcoulombs, coulombs. So these formulae tell you what the units are in general. Mass is always in kilograms. Mass is always in kilograms. Distances are in meters. And charges are measured in coulombs. So you can see that here. Again, I would suggest you try and get a printed out version of this formula sheet. And what you do is, next to all the variables, so for example, under motion, 
you write Vf and you say that that is final velocity and you say that it is measured in meters per second. And then delta x is displacement and it's measured in meters. And um, A is acceleration and it's measured in meters per second squared. You can even make a little note about which ones do or don't need directions. Another thing which is really useful from this thing, from this formula sheet, is actually the definitions. So this formula here is Newton's law of universal gravitation. And it tells us that if we ignore the constant just for the moment, it tells us that the force is directly proportional to the product of the two masses and inversely proportional to the square of the distance between their two centers, which is true as well of Coulomb's law. And so often we can actually you must look at your definitions and look at your formulas and see if you can't help yourself remember your definitions by just using your formulas. There's another one here. Newton's second law is hidden in this one over here. If you rearrange it, you get that A is equal to F net over M. So Newton's second law tells us that when a non-zero resultant or net force acts on a body, it will accelerate in the direction of the force. And the acceleration is directly proportional to the force and inversely proportional to the mass of the object. So this is just another example of where you can use your formula sheet to help you remember your definitions. This one is another one. Power is the rate divided by time at which work is done. Rate means divided by time. So this little formula here will help you remember the definition for power. Okay, so a few more. This formula will help you learn the Coulomb's law. So if you ignore the constant, you can put in a directly proportional sign there. The force is directly proportional to the product of the two charges and inversely proportional to the distance between their centers. I also find that this is a useful formula to remember the unit for electric field. I think we remember that force is measured in newtons and charge is measured in coulombs. If you don't know that charge is measured in coulombs, you can remember it by using what I showed you with the table with the constants. So if force is measured in newtons and charge is measured in coulombs, you end up with electric field being measured in newtons per coulomb. You can write it either way, just so that you don't forget the units. I do think we need to spend some time with our formula sheet and just write down all the variables and their units and whether they are vectors or scalars. We also want to remember that when we're using the formulas, we want to copy them exactly as is from the formula sheet, except for these two. For these two, we don't want to see this in your formula. We want you to apply the formula to the question. So to be silly, if there were eight resistors, you need to write this eight times. You don't put a dot, dot, dot. You write it for each of the eight that are applicable in your question. If there are three things in parallel, you write it, your formula specifically to the example that you see in front of you. We don't write the plus dot, dot, dot. But for the other formulas, we write everything that we see on the formula sheet. We write it exactly as we see on the formula sheet in our question. And then we substitute a number into the formula. You get your marks for using the formula. You cannot just write random formulas all over the place. You need to substitute numbers into the place of the variables. So what you can do now is, for example, here we write P and we say we call it power and it's measured in watts. And then R is resistance, and it's measured in ohms. We take the time, we make ourselves a formula sheet with all of the units and all of the variables labeled, and then we use that formula sheet when we are studying so that when we are in the exam, we can remember our own special formula sheet which has everything labeled, and hopefully we can improve our physics marks. Okay, so how to prepare for the exam. What you do is you use the exam guidelines to see what they're allowed to ask you and how they're going to ask you, the kinds of words they're going to use 
and how many marks per section. You must study your definitions word for word from the exam guidelines. Those are your level one questions and those are the ones where you get the easy marks. Nothing changes, you don't need to apply anything, you must just learn like a parrot, word for word, all of your definitions which are given in the exam guidelines. You go through the examples in your workbook or textbook, or even better than that, you work through the past NSC papers which are available at this website. So I, I personally think that this is probably your best bet because then you can see how the questions are worded and what the memo requires you to do. I do think that this is possibly the best way to practice. So just think, even for all of your subjects, if you can just work your way through, say, maybe even five exam papers with the memos, I think you will be quite prepared for your exam. If you can go through 10, even better. If you can go through 20, that's fantastic. But work through the past exam papers and make sure that you are familiar with it so that you don't get a fright in your exam. You get given 10 minutes of reading time, use this time, read through the questions and think to yourself, I'm going to do question 8, then I'm going to do question 5, then I'm going to do question 3, because those are the ones that looked straightforward to me and those are the ones I enjoy doing. You start with the questions you can answer first and then you move on to the rest and you don't have to answer the questions in the correct order. You get given a booklet and you can label First thing you can do, you can label all the pages, question one, question two, question three, four, if you want to, or you can just label your pages according to the question that you're currently doing, but you can start with question eight, if that makes you happy. I have marked final papers, and we go and look for our questions. So for example, if I'm marking question six, I will page through the entire book to find question six. So you do not have to do it in order at all. I would also suggest that maybe you answer the question that you can answer for each question. So for example, you label your page question 3 and then normally question 3.1 will be a definition. So you just write that because you studied your definitions and then 3.2 might be some sort of free body diagram or force diagram or something and you can do that. Then 3.3 is a simple calculation, you can do that. But 3.4 is a more complex calculation. You think, uh-uh, I'm going to come back to that one. So if you at least guarantee that you get all the, typically the first questions are the easier ones. So you go through your whole paper and you just make sure that you answer all the straightforward questions for each question. Question 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8. You label each of the pages according to the question numbers. And then at the end, if you have time, you come back for the more difficult ones. So for example, 3.4 is quite tricky. So what you can do is write a formula from your formula sheet and substitute in a few numbers. And then you think, no, 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 this is getting too tricky for me. And then move on to the next question. So you put something down, but you make a mark on your question paper, which questions you're going to come back to. And you just ensure that you have enough time to go through the first questions of each question. Because typically, 3.1, 4.1, 5.1, 6.1 are normally your level 1 definitions. Okay, I'm just going to read through your instructions. Your invigilator should read through your instructions as well before you write your exam. Number 1, you need to write your exam number and centre number on your answer book. And then the question will tell you how many questions there are. It should be 10. We just went through which, what each question will be. You start each question on a new page in your answer book. You number the questions according to how they numbered them in the exam paper. You leave one line open between sub-questions. So 2.1, you write your definition answer. And then 2.2, you just leave a line. It just makes it easier for the marker to mark it. You are allowed to use a known programmable calculator. You can use appropriate mathematical instruments. You, can, you must show all of your formulae and substitutions in your calculations. So this is very important. You get your formulae, you copy them from the formula sheet, except for those two that I discussed you, with you with the plus and the dot, dot, dot. But you go fetch your formulas from the formula sheet, and then you substitute some or other number into it. So that can guarantee us one or two marks for all the calculation questions. And if they get too difficult, we just make a note 
on our question paper and we come back to them at the end if we have time. We need to get through all the straightforward questions in all 10 of the questions in the exam and then we can come back to fight mathematically with the more difficult ones. You must round off your final answers to a minimum of two decimal places, at least two decimal places, and when you need to give a reason, they do say please be brief. Ideally in physics you would also explain your answer using one of the formulas from your formula sheet. So you can use the directly and inversely proportional relationships from the formulas given on your formula sheet. And then they say here that you must look at the, at the data sheets. That's obviously your formula sheets and your page with the constants. We've spoken about that. And you must write neatly and legibly as far as possible, please. Okay, so on the day of the paper, this one, honestly, I don't really agree with. I don't agree that you have to complete the entire question. So I do suggest, though, that, for example, question four. 4.1, we write our definition because we studied our definitions. 4.2 is a simple calculation. We do that. 4.3 is a difficult calculation. It's a complex question. There's lots of stuff going on. What I do is I mark the numbers in the question and I make sure I understand that the 5 is a mass. It's 5 kilograms, for example. And the 7 meters is a, is a distance or a displacement. And I make note of all of my little numbers that I get given in the question. I find an appropriate formula. So, for example, question 4 is momentum and impulse. So I go to the formulas that are for momentum and impulse. For example, the momentum formula is P equals MV. And I use an appropriate formula and I put one of the numbers from the question into that formula. I have used an appropriate formula. I will get marks for that. When it gets to the point where you start feeling uncomfortable or confused, you move on to the next question and you'll see then you'll do the easier questions from the next question. So 4.3 is giving you a headache. You move on to 5.1, which again will typically be a level one definition. So you just write the definition. And we want to maybe get to our definitions as soon as possible, just so we can remember them. Because it is level one remembering parrot work. You must show all the steps in your calculation. When I'm marking it, please don't make me guess what it is that you're doing. Show me what you're doing. If you think it in your head, your head, you write it on the page. Try and write it nicely one underneath the other and make sure that you don't do weird things like when we do this, 1 over RP is equal to 1 over R1 plus 1 over R2. Then we sub in, like I told you, we do 1 over RP whoops, is equal to 1 over 2 plus 1 over 4. And then we do this cool thing where we say, okay, so now that is equal to 4 over 3. So what you have written is that a half plus a quarter is equal to 4 over 3. That is not true. You're talking nonsense. Mathematically, this is correct. I understand, as a science teacher, what you did was you flipped this side and you flipped this side, but you need to show me that. Don't make me guess what you're doing. Show me exactly what you're doing. Because if you say that 1 over 2 plus 1 over 4 is equal to 4 over 3, you're lying. That's not true. You can't say 1 plus 3 equals 5 because it doesn't. So for physics, we don't need to really see your maths necessarily, but you can't write nonsense in terms of the maths and expect to get marks. Your maths needs to be correct. 1 over 2 plus 1 over 4 is equal to 3 over 4 which you then flip to make 4 over 3. You need to show what's happening on both the left-hand side and the right-hand side to ensure that your maths is correct so that you can get your marks for the physics. The next point here is that you must please list all the variables before the calculation. So that's more for you than for me. I don't give you a mark for that, but it's a good idea like I said, to get all the numbers out of the question and make sure that you understand what they're all there for. And normally, you will use all of them at some point in your calculations. 
you must use your subscripts. So as it's given on the formula sheet, write your formulas as they are given on the formula sheet. It is given right there. Please do not remember it. Use your formula sheet. With the vectors, I need you to think about, you write how much, what, which way. The vectors, the vector, how much, it's five, what, meters, which way, right. So for all of your answers, when it's a vector in physics, how much, what, which way, amount, unit, direction for all of your vector answers. Reread your question and just make sure that everything was fine before you move on to the next one. Remember to bring your calculator with or if you don't have one, make sure that you borrow one. Go and borrow one from a grade 10 or 11 or a 9 or an 8 or a teacher. Please don't not have a calculator because you're too scared to ask. You have roughly one minute per mark because you are writing for 120, um, 180 minutes. You have three hours for 150 marks. So if you can do a mark a minute, approximately, some of them will be faster, some of them will be slower. But if approximately do a mark a minute, you'll have a half an hour to look over your paper at the end. Your level one questions, I need you to be able to define things such as the conservative force and state Newton's second law and state principles like the principle of conservation of linear momentum and draw free body diagrams. You also need to be able to write word for word your definitions. The 2021 exam guidelines are available online and you learn your definitions word for word from there. And here, like I've told you before, you copy your formula as is from the data sheet and then you substitute values. You don't get marks for just writing the formula. You need to put a number into it. Okay, so you need to learn your definitions. Like for example, the normal force is the force or component of a force which a surface exerts on an object with which it is in contact and which is perpendicular to the surface. So typically when we do definitions, we look for certain words and if these words are present and in general you're saying the correct things, you can get the marks. But normally, preferably, ideally, you just learn these things word for word. So you write it word for word, but then sometimes you can lose marks if certain words are not included. So there are some vital words in the definition that have to be there. But if we just learn all of our definitions word for word, learn, you can learn them like the lyrics of a song. Make a song out of it. Frictional force is the force that opposes the motion of an object and acts parallel to the surface. So for example, the words that I would have to have there, it opposes the motion and it's parallel to the surface. So without those words, you're gonna start losing marks. So please, just learn your definitions word for word. A few more definitions. St static frictional force is the force that opposes the tendency of motion of a stationary object relative to the surface. And then here is the formula for static frictional force. And then kinetic frictional force is the force that opposes the motion of a moving object relative to the surface. So you can see that these two definitions are basically exactly the same. So if you can study the one, you can just alter what you've studied to know the other one as well. Okay, what you also need to know is that a frictional force is directly proportional to the normal force. How are you supposed to know that? You look on your formula sheet and you get the formula. Imagine that that number isn't there. And if you put in the directly proportional sign, the friction is directly proportional to the normal force. If the normal force increases, the friction increases. It says that it's independent of the area of contact because the formula does not have any sort of area in it. The formula has how difficult is it to drag on the surface, the coefficient of friction, and it has the normal force. And the normal force typically consists of mass times gravity. So where is area? It's not in the formula. So friction is independent of the area. Friction is independent of the velocity. 
there is no velocity in the formula, and so it is independent of the velocity. We need to understand our formulas, we need to remember our units, and when applicable, we need to remember our directions. How much, what, which way. Okay, so practical work is examinable. You need to understand the practicals, for example, the conservation of momentum and the internal resistance. How did they happen? What are the variables, the independent variable, the dependent variable? And you need to know how to interpret your graphs. So just for example, if I have a VI graph like this, I can expect you to get meaning from this graph and derive values from this graph. So I've drawn a very rough one here. It can look like that, it can look like that. But the method is always the same. No matter what the graph is and no matter what the variables are, from mathematics, we know that this is the x value and this is the y value. So for this graph, we go to our formula sheet and we find the formula, this bad boy over here, and we convert this into the information that's on this graph. So EMF, IR, we know is equal to voltage. And so now we have that the Y value, V, is here. And the X value, I, is here. So what we do is we replace the X and the Y. And so we get that EMF is equal to y plus x r because the y value is voltage and the x value is current and with this formula we take this one and we convert it into y equals mx plus c which is the standard form of the maths formula and once we've done that we can gain information about what does the gradient mean what does the y-intercept mean and then we can answer the questions that are given. We can give you any sort of graph. Doppler effect can have a graph, photoelectric effect can have a graph, circuits can have a graph, and the method that we use is always find a formula on the formula sheet where you can find the y value and the x value in the same formula, and then convert that formula with the y and the x into the standard form so that we can find what does the gradient mean, what does the y-intercept mean. So for this example, what I would do, and it's very gross because I've written all over the place now, it would look something like this. And so if I wrote it nicely, it would be y equals minus rx plus emf. So if I have a graph that looks like this with v and i, the gradient of the graph, the gradient is negative r, and the y-intercept is the EMF. What did I do? I took a formula from the formula sheet, I replaced the y and x values with the values in the formula, I rearranged the formula into the standard form mathematically so that I could figure out what does the gradient mean and what does the y-intercept mean. Okay, so we need to be aware of what the words mean. So when they tell you to name something or state something or explain something, and these words will help you know how much you need to answer. The mark allocation will also help you with this. How are we going to tackle this problem? We are going to do past exam papers to see the words that they use to ask questions, and then we can check the memos to see what is required in terms of answers. This point I do actually agree with. Don't leave anything blank. If you leave it blank, it's definitely wrong. Write something. So if you're not sure, make a mark on your question paper and remind yourself to come back to it, but always write something. Please remember, do not write notes to your markers. That is not allowed, but you can write something in all the spaces just to ensure you are getting the maximum marks possible. So this point I agree with a lot. Don't, don't answer the questions that are difficult. Even when you're studying, if you, for example, are good at Doppler effect, so you are quite good at Doppler, but unfortunately you find um, work energy power quite challenging. So what happens is we know that we're good at Doppler, we're fine with Doppler, we ignore Doppler. 
We know that web is difficult, work energy power is difficult. So we study, 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 work energy power. We walk into the exam and we see, oh my goodness, the work energy power question is really difficult. And when I go to the Doppler effect question, I can't remember how to do Doppler effect because I stressed all my time and I studied all my time with work energy power. It's a silly little analogy, but I try and tell my classes, if you are a really good goalie in football, for example, if you are a very good goalie, you don't really go to practices and practice how to score goals. You are a goalie. Your job, your skill lies with stopping goals, not scoring them. So like that analogy, if you are a very good goalie, you are very good at Doppler. At the practices, you practice being a goalie. You practice your Doppler effect questions. You are good at your Doppler effect questions. You get good marks for them. They make you feel nice. You enjoy doing them. You practice your Doppler effect questions. You don't practice scoring goals, but you can if you feel completely comfortable with your goal saving abilities, you can actually try some goal scoring. And when you get to the exam, you go quickly to your question six, you get 100% for your question six, your goal saving question that you know that you're naturally good at. And for your work energy power question, which you were never really comfortable with, you just do the basics. You put the formula, you put the numbers in the formula, then you move on. So everyone needs to have at least a few questions that they're comfortable with. You spend your time practicing those questions. You go into your exam, you get the highest marks possible for those questions, and then you put something in all the spaces for the questions that you didn't really enjoy. The idea is we don't spend all our time studying the questions that we find difficult. We spend the majority of our time studying the questions that we actually find quite easy the ones that we're good at, the ones that make sense to us, we perfect those ones. And so we can guarantee ourselves, say, 60% in the exam. And then if we have time, we can try the ones that we find more challenging. So don't spend all your time on challenging questions. Make sure you understand and are familiar with and are perfecting the basics. Hello, Greg Tolls. Here we are ready to tackle question one in this final push physical sciences segment for Metro North Education District. My name is Mr. Goldstone, and it's my privilege to guide you through question one drawn from the November 2020 paper. But before we get there, let us go through some very important points that you need to remember in connection with tackling multiple choice questions in exams. Now, as you know, question one in physical science paper one is multiple choice. There are certain strategies that we would like you to give attention to as you work through these questions. Firstly, budget your time in the exam. You may answer multiple choice questions last, I would recommend that when you get your paper, remember, go through your multiple choice questions. Check and see which ones do you really know. And the ones that are challenging, the ones that you don't really know, well, leave them for later. But by all means, attempt every single thing. Remember, you can only mark one answer. If you mark two answers, well, that is not really marked. In fact, you get it wrong, right? So budgeting your time is very, very important. Next, attempt to answer the questions in consecutive order. Very important. Ignore the answer choices. And you know, sometimes learners don't know the answer to a particular question, and they come up with the reasoning, oh, this is always a C, it's always a B, or maybe this is always a D, or how could this be another B? No, try and do what makes sense in terms of the principles of physics. 
we're looking for absolute truth. Read your question carefully to determine the precise requirement that is stated in the particular multiple choice question. And you'll see how this plays off in our program today. Determine the correct answer before reading the answer choices. In other words, you look at the opening statement and then you try and come up with the answer and then see whether any one of the options really matches your answer as well. Read the answer choices carefully and select the best answer. Remember, there are distractors in those options. And so therefore you want the answer that is the best and nothing but the very best. Okay, so these are very important points. So let's go straight in. Here we are, November 2020 paper, question one. Question 1.1 1. 1 says, as you can see, the rate of change of momentum of an object is equal to Rate 12, so I want to go across to my visualizer. Here we are, the rate of change of momentum. Now we know, right? Take note, I haven't even looked at the options yet, but we know that the rate of change of momentum in physics is given by the following formula. F net delta T is equal to delta P. Right? We know that this is the formula that represents even impulse, right? And the impulse momentum theorem. And so, therefore, if we make F net the subject of our formula, we're going to have the rate of change of momentum. Okay? There we go. Delta T. So, what are we saying? The rate of change of momentum, right, according to what we know, is none other than the net force acting on an object. You get that? Notice this is all rigged around the entire principles from a formula. So let's go back and see. Remember that? Infinite. So we get back there. The rate of change of momentum of an object is equal to the impulse of the object, option A? Definitely not. The net force acting on the object? Yes, we saw that. You remember that? We saw that there. There it is, the net force. But let's go on. Maybe there's a better. The product of the object's mass and its change in velocity? Certainly not. The product of the net force acting on the object and its acceleration? Definitely not. Great 12, the only option, as you know, is option B. We proved it by means of our entire principle here that we saw. Right? So the rate of change of momentum is none other than the net force acting on the object. Well done. Now let's go to question 1.2. Question 1.2, as you can see, reads, the gravitational acceleration on the surface of planet X with mass M and radius R is G. Okay? That's very important. Then they say, the gravitational acceleration on the surface of planet Y with mass 2M and radius of half R is, well, Let's go across to our paper again. Here we have the visualizer. We know that the gravitational acceleration, right, G for any planet is the universal gravitation multiplied by the mass of the planet, the object divided by R squared. We know that that is the case. All right. Now, how do we proceed in this connection? Well, if we have to look at what we are given, then we're talking about planet Y, right? Planet Y. Let's see what applies in this case here. Well, for planet Y, 
we are told the following situation obtains. When we have G is equal to, we're going to have the universal gravitation constant. They tell us here, if you look at your question very carefully, the question says for planet Y, the mass is 2M and the radius is a half R. So what are we doing? We are now going to put 2M here. And then we're going to put a radius of a half a R. R, R. And we must square that because there's a square. So what does this result in? I'm just going to go across this way. That's equal to 2, right? So in other words, we're going to have 2, capital G, M, right? And then a half squared, as you know, is a quarter R squared. So if we have to take the numbers away, right? Can you see the following pattern emerging? This here, right? This particular part here is exactly this G, exactly G, as you can see, this G here, exactly that, right? That's G. So according to the principles of mathematics, when you bring a quarter, two divided by a quarter, we can actually use our calculator for this, right? We can say fraction button two divided by, and put another fraction there, a quarter. What's the answer? Eight. So final answer is 8G, right? Why do we say 8G? Because that G, as you can see, this is exactly that. So this is what we are looking for. So planet Y, right, can be represented by 8G. So now let's look and see whether any of these options are mentioned in the multiple choices that we basically have. So we go back. There we have A is a half G. No. B is G. Definitely not. C is 4G. No. But look at option D. Yes, there's our answer. So we go there and we notice that that is the case. Did you notice once again, grade 12, it's all got to do with the various formulae. I'll show you this again, just so that you see. Remember, this gravitational acceleration is given by that formula. This is a grade 11 question, actually. So in grade 11, this is what you did when you did Newton's laws, especially Newton's law of universal gravitation. And what we did here is we simply substituted what the question said was the mass and the radius here. And then we got these particular items here. And then we found out mathematically that this is 8 and that represents a G and that's our option. So once again, it's option D. That is the correct answer there. Moving on to question 1.3. Now we come to a question that deals with vertical projectile motion. The question reads, the graph below shows how one of the physical quantities associated with an object in free fall, there's an important detail, changes with time. The label on the y-axis is omitted. Ignore friction. So which one of the physical quantities can the label be on the y-axis? Grade 12s, we know the following. That when an object is in free fall, there's only one force acting on the object, and that force is none other than G. That's the gravitational force of the gravitational acceleration. And that's 9,8, as we know, 9,8 meters per second squared. Right. That's the only force acting on that G. Right. So we need to look for one of the options given to us. All right. That definitely involves this. And the only option that is given to us that involves a G, as we can see. Right. Velocity does not involve a G. Position does not involve a G. Weight, as we know, well, we know 
according to Newton's second law of motion, right? Remember, weight is equal to mg. So there we have the g, there we have the g, and this speaks very nicely to free fall as well. So therefore, the only correct option for question 1.3 as we can see it, is option C. It cannot be the momentum, because momentum is defined as the product of the mass multiplied by the velocity. And the velocity disqualified itself in option A as well. So definitely, we are not even going to think about that at all. All right. So the only option is option C. That was question 1.3. Can you believe it? We already have six marks. Why? We are faithful to the principles, doing what makes sense, and following the direction that has been outlined in the various concepts that we have examined. Let's move on to our next question. Question 1.4. This is a question that involves momentum and impulse again. Let's read this very carefully. The question says, a ball of mass M falling vertically downwards. Now, we need to illustrate this. The ball is falling vertically downwards. So there's the ball. Okay. There's the ball. It's, a, it's falling vertically downwards. That's what we are told. All right. And then we are told hits the floor at a speed V. Right? So there we go. Hits the floor at speed V. All right. There we have our speed V illustrated there. Now, and bounces vertically upwards at speed 0, 0,75. Now, that V that's there, we must recognize that that speed is 1 V. All right, that's what V stands for. It's 1V. Now it bounces, we are told, vertically upwards at 0, 0,75. So if we have to place it all almost exactly the same, right, there we have it like that. And now all we can say is this is 0, 0,75 and V, they tell us. Okay, 0, 0,75V. There we have our little diagram. Which one of the following combinations regarding the change in momentum is the change of the momentum of the ball during collision is correct. Right. Now, this is very easy. Great right, 12. If you think about it, look at what we've got here. The ball is going down, and because there is a change in direction. There is none other than the following situation happening. If we have to draw a situation that goes like this, right? What is 1 plus 0, 0,75? None other than 1,75 B. That's really what it is. All right? Notice there's a change in direction. That's really what it is here. And all of that as illustrated. So when we look now at our situation, here we are. Look at the options. Option A, 0, 0,25. We're not even going to think about that. 0, 0,25. Option B, certainly disqualified. Look at C, 1,75 MV upwards. Oh, yes. Different. What about 1, MV, 1, 1,75 MV downwards? Definitely not. Definitely not downwards. So the only correct option that we are going to explore is this situation here, which is what we see here, right? So there we have it, right? Let's say MV, I just, M there, right, there we go. All right, so there we go, because of the change in direction, and there we have it all very clear. Once again, option C is the correct answer, and that is what we are going to register. All right, great. Now we move on to our next question, and our next question, once again, explores a formula. Question 1.5 says, 
the SI unit of the physical quantity work is, right? There we go, work. Now we know, according to what we learned in term two, when we did work, work, right, is defined as the force multiplied by the displacement, okay? We know that that's the case, All right? Work, force multiplied by the displacement. Now we know the SI unit for force is the Newton. Right, so let's take that. Newton mul multiplied by displacement is the meter. All right. But now, here's the thing. Let's look at this Newton. Do you not agree from Newton's second law of motion, which is F is equal to MA, right? F is equal to MA. This mass is the kilogram. The acceleration is meter per second squared. All right, so there we have it. So now let us bring this together. In other words, we're going to bring this and we're going to substitute it here. What have we got? We've got this. Remember, this is still work now. Is equal to kilogram meter per second and then we have another meter remember this this meter is still here we can't forget about that so meter times meter will give us a m squared uh, s minus two that's what work is actually equal to can you see that work is equal to the kilogram meter squared per second squared all right, so let's remember this important point and let's go to our options and see where we come. So we go back and there we see, is it option A? Definitely not. Is it option B? Definitely not. Notice that's a distractor. We could easily make a mistake and say it's B, but look at option C. Oh my goodness. Option C, right? There we have it right there, okay? Option C is the kilogram meter squared per second squared, right? And there we have it. And notice even the final one. Then we have question 1.6, right? Question 1.6 says the siren of a police car moving in the front of a truck emits sound waves of frequency F. Both vehicles are traveling at the same constant velocity. Now, you know what, grade 12? That is an important point. When both vehicles are traveling at the same constant velocity, there is no relative motion between the vehicles. As a result of that, why the Doppler effect cannot obtain. In other words, there's no Doppler effect that can happen. Hence, the frequency of the sound heard by the driver is simply option A. It is simply the F. Okay? That is that. There's nothing more to that because the frequency is exactly what is emitted by the sound waves, and that's that. So there we have option six as well. Okay? Let's look at question number seven. Question number seven. Two identical metal spheres, P and R, on insulated stands carry different charges, right? That's what we are told, P and R. The, char the spheres are brought into contact and then separated again. If the charge on sphere R after separation is Q, the charge on sphere P after separation is? Now, once again, conceptual. We know from electrostatics, in fact, once again from grade 10, that if we have to look at the new charge, remember the Q nu, we can say, is gonna be the Q1 plus Q2 over two. Remember that formula that was used there? 
And now in this particular question, right? Basically what's happening here is we're using P and R. So that's equal to the charge on P plus the charge on R over two. And now when you look at this situation, all very clear, they tell us, if you look at the question, they tell us if the charge on R is Q. So in other words, when we look at this charge here, right, the Q on R is, they tell us Q. We know that when this happens, these charges must be the same. They are identical. Therefore, the charge on P must also be Q. Because remember, when two spheres touch, they separate, the charges are identical. Hence, if the charge on R is small Q, then the charge on P must also be small Q, because this is the principle that underpins it. So if we go back to the options, it's option A. That is the correct answer, and that's what we want right there. All right. Can you believe it? We are already finished with question 1.7. Did you notice, grade 12, how the conceptual understanding of physical sciences is important for tackling question 1? Now we come to question 1.8. Question 1.8 says, an AC generator generates a current with a frequency of 50 hertz. The number of times that the maximum current is produced in one second is, well, we know how this goes, okay? Let's have a look. We know that if we have to draw a graph, right? Just a graph, just to illustrate what's really happening here. We know that there's our graph, right? We just put an X and Y axis, right? And in a very real sense, we know what's happening with how graphs are basically taken. If we go like that, right? If we just have to draw a graph like that, right? So what we are looking at here is the point there, right? And we know that that's, and we know that that's, there, and we know that that's there. Now, what we are told here, right? If you look at those points that I've just drawn, the question says the following. The question says the number of times that the maximum, that's the peak current is produced in one second is, look, if we've got 50 hertz, a frequency of 50 hertz, that means if we look at the dots that I've just drawn, right? 50 hertz, there should be 50 times two because there's one, two. That is one complete wave cycle. Can you see that? That's a maximum, that's also a maximum, right? That's also a peak in a sense. And so in a very real sense, it's gonna be 50 multiplied by two. The answer is none other than option D. And as we can see, it is 100. Very, very important, okay. So there we have that very nicely highlighted for us. When we go to our next question, and as we know, our next question involves electrical circuits. Now let's read this one with understanding because it can really, really work us up. In the circuit below, the battery has an internal resistance R and an EMF as we know it. A variable resistor is connected in the circuit and the ammeter and voltmeter readings, um, voltmeter register readings. We are now told the resistance of the variable resistor is now increased. The resistance is increased. Which one of the following combinations is the correct representation of the reading of the ammeter and the voltmeter as the resistance of R is increased. The 12s, here is our understanding of that. You may remember that even in our spring school, this point came up for honorary mention. Remember what I mentioned. If we have to look at the situation, right? If we look at um, 
For example, we have this formula here. EMF is equal to, and this EMF is equal to I, open brackets, R plus small r. Now we can use the principles of this to formulate the following, right? We can say, look, this EMF here, right? Well, we can't call that the EMF now. Let's call that the load. Let's say V load, right? That's our concept there. This, let's say the total current, all right? Total current. Right? This R, total resistance. And, and the IR will represent the lost boss. You may remember it was discussed in our spring school 2022, the lost boss. So now we've got some interesting concepts here. Let's, let's just put little, little rings around them. We're not putting equal to signs because we are formulating a very interesting principle that underpins electrical circuits here. All right. Now, what's fascinating about this is when one of these increases, for example, if your total current, right, if your total current increases, right, give another pin that will highlight that nicely. If this guy increases like that, well, automatically the one next door will decrease. And then automatically, this is going down. This one will go up. And then if this is going up, this is going to go down. You see that? Right. Now let's take another situation. If this V load increases, right there it increases, right? I'm using the black pen now. Then this one that's next door will go down. Then this one will go up. And then this one will go down. What are we saying in this connection, right? Notice, once again, we use th that principle, but we itemizing things. So here we have V load, right? That forms part of this whole thing. That's the total current, the total resistance, and the loss volts. Right? These are the various concepts. Now let's look at this. Remember, if your load goes down, then your total current increases. And as a result, your total resistance decreases. As a result, your loss volts increases. If your load is up, then your total current goes down. Your total resistance increases, your loss volts decreases. Now let's go back to our question. The question says the following to us. Look at this. Here we see this. Which one of the following combinations represents the correct representation of the changes as the resistance is increased, right? So notice now, if the resistance is increased, your current will decrease. What's going to happen to your V load? That's going to increase, all right? So let's keep these two points in mind. Your current is going to decrease. So your ammeter reading is going to decrease. And there your voltmeter reading is going to increase. So let's go back to our options. When we look at our options, look at option A. Option A says your ammeter reading decreases and your voltmeter reading increases. That's exactly correct. So option A is the correct one. All we did is we used this principle, this diagrammatic representation, to guide us in connection with our understanding of electrical circuits. Very, very important. Now, let's go back to our question one. We at our final question, question number 10. If we look at question number 10, question number 10 says, sodium cathode of a photocell is irradiated with ultraviolet light as shown in the diagram below. The ammeter registers a current. So already there's a current that's going, right? And as we know, charge is flowing because that's why there's a current. Of course, this question falls under the section, the photoelectric effect. 
The question says, which one of the following will increase the amateur reading? Let's look at the options. Use a thinner sodium cathode. Never, ever, ever will that increase the amateur reading. Increase the intensity of the ultraviolet light. Oh, yes. That's a very good point. That's how we can increase the amateur reading. There's no doubt about that. Increase the frequency of the ultraviolet light? Ah, never. Sorry about that. No. Replace the sodium cathode with a cathode of a lower work function? Never, ever, ever. That will certainly not have effect. The only correct answer, grade 12, is option B. Increase the intensity of the ultraviolet light. That's how an increase in the amateur reading will be effective. We're going to consider Newton's laws of motion. Now, you may recall that in grade 11, you studied about Newton's laws. Newton's first law of motion states, a body will remain in its state of rest or motion at constant velocity unless a non-zero resultant or net force acts on it. Grade 12s, please remember, you must state unless a non-zero resultant or net force acts on it when writing that definition out. What about Newton's second law of motion? Well, Newton's second law of motion states, when a net force acts on an object, the object will accelerate in the direction of the force, and the acceleration is directly proportional to the force and inversely proportional to the mass of the object. You may recall the equation, F net is equal to MA. And that's why we see on the screen, when we make the acceleration the subject of the formula, A is equal to F net divided by M. Newton's third law of motion states, when object A exerts a force on object B, object B simultaneously exerts an oppositely directed force of equal magnitude on object A. Now that is a definition that has been adjusted in the new examination guidelines. And the new definition is shown on the screen. Once again, Newton's third law states, when an object, ex when object A exerts a force on object B, object B simultaneously exerts an oppositely directed force of equal magnitude on object A. Make sure you know that very well. And then we come to Newton's law of universal gravitation. That law states, each body in the universe attracts every other body with a force that is directly proportional to the product of their masses and inversely proportional to the square of the distance between their centers. You may remember the formula that relates to Newton's law of universal gravitation. And that formula is F is equal to G, capital G, M1, M2, over R squared. That's found on your information sheet or formula sheet. Now, there are some points that we must remember when working with Newton's laws. And here they are. Firstly, label your free body diagram correctly. Draw your arrows in and make sure that the forces, which the arrows represent, should be in contact with the body. So from the dot, your force must extend with an arrow. It must touch the dot. And then you need to draw free body diagrams for each object correctly and use them in your problem solving calculations. For example, Take note of the following. Suppose we are asked to draw a label free body diagram for the eight kilogram block shown in the diagram here. Well, how many forces 
are acting on that eight kilogram block. Would you believe that there are five of them? Let's label them. The one to the right, there we have it here. That is the applied force. And you can see it clearly indicated here. Then we have to the left, tension as well as the friction. And so we see these two forces shown here. And then the vertical forces. Here we have the perpendicular force. This is called the normal force. There we see it clearly indicated here. And then we have the weight or FG, the force due to gravity. There it's shown here. Now, how will a diagram like this be marked? Notice you'll get a mark for each of the label forces that you've drawn in. Did you also notice that all the arrows must touch the dot? The dot represents the object, in this case, the eight kilogram block. Now, when an object moves at constant velocity, we need to remember that the net force will be zero because the acceleration equals zero. Also, when there's a change in velocity, the object accelerates and F net will not be equal to zero. Now we have to apply Newton's second law of motion given by the equation F net is equal to MA. Also important is for us to remember that the net force acting on an object represents the sum of all the forces acting on that object. Then two, trigonometric relations should also be applied when needed. And this comes into play, especially when there are angles that are mentioned in our diagram. You may remember in grade 10 trigonometry, we drew a triangle and there we saw that theta has a side below it, which is called the adjacent. And then opposite theta, that side is called the opposite. And then the hypotenuse is the longer side of that right angle triangle. Well, these are principles that play off in connection with Newton's laws, especially when there are angles involved. The sine of theta and the cosine of theta are ratios that will be used here as well. So let's look at a question from a past question paper. This question was question two, drawn from the November 2020 exam paper, as you can see above. The question stated, a 20 kilogram block resting on a rough horizontal surface is connected by blocks P and Q by a light inextensible string moving over a frictionless pulley. Blocks P and Q are glued together and have a combined mass of M. So do we have the picture? There's the 20 kilogram block indicator right here. There we have the pulley and we are told that it's a frictionless pulley and there's a light inextensible string. So in other words, that string cannot be stretched and it's light, whatever plays off in terms of the string and the pulley are negligible amounts. So they will not influence our calculations adversely at all. We are also told that blocks P and Q, as we can see in the diagram, are glued together. And so they have a combined mass of M. Very interesting. Then we are told a force of 35 Newton, and here we see it indicated here, is now applied to the 20 kilogram block. So that's an applied force of 35 Newton, but it's applied at an angle of 40 degrees. There's our trigonometry coming into play. 40 degrees with the horizontal as shown below. There we have our nice diagram shown for us. And right below that we read, the 20 kilogram block experiences a frictional force of magnitude five Newton as it moves to the right, notice, to the right at constant speed. So to the right is in bold as well as constant speed also in caps as well.
Now, question 2.1 says, define the term normal force. Do you remember the definition of the normal force? Oh, yes, I'm sure you do. The normal force is defined as the perpendicular force exerted by a surface on the object. You remember that? The normal force is the perpendicular force exerted by a surface on an object in contact with the surface. So you must state how the force acts and on what does it act. Very important. Let's go to our next question. Let's draw a labeled three-body diagram of the forces acting on the 20 kilogram block. Now, grade 12, I have my visualizer here. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to go across to my visualizer and we are going to draw this together. All right, let's have a look at this. The 20 kilogram block, I'm going to illustrate by making a dot. So the dot here represents my 20 kilogram block. Very, very important. Right. Now, looking at my diagram, you've got your diagram, and what I've got is I've got past the paper right here, okay? So there's a question from the 2020 paper, the 20 kilogram block. Notice here now, I have, let me handle my vertical forces. I know that there's a force going this way, vertically, and there's a force going down. So let me draw that in. This one, going this way. Notice I'm connecting it to the block, right? This force to the block right here. And I'm going to call that my normal force. I put a capital N because I was told to label the force, right? And then I know that forces act in pairs. So there's a force that goes this way here. This is my weight, or I could call it FG, right? FG weight or FG. So they are my vertical forces. What about the other forces? This is a nice, easy one to remember. Notice it's going in this direction. So I can actually take my ruler and keep it in at that same angle there. When I take my ruler and keep it at that angle and I draw the force, right? That is going to be my applied force going there. There's my applied force. And then I label that force in. Notice what I'm going to call it. I'm going to say that's F applied. Very important. All right, so I've got three forces. But now I also have a frictional force going in this direction. So I must indicate that as well. And of course, I know that that is less than my applied force. So I'm going to show that like here. And I'm just going to call that small f. Okay, or if you want to, you could even put it like that, frictional force. All right, and then finally, if you look at this, notice this 20 kilogram block is connected to this object, which we know as M, so there's tension in the string. I must also show that. And so there, I show my tension going this way. I draw my force that way. Arrow, remember, that was one of the focus points that we discussed. And there I put my tension, capital T. Right. So what does my diagram look like? So if I look at my diagram, right, on the 20 kilogram block, I've got my normal force. There's my normal force right here. Right. I've got my FG or my weight. There's my FG or the weight right here. Then I have my applied force. And then I have my frictional force. And then I have my tension, right? Notice there were five marks for that question. And therefore, I have five forces. One, two, three, four, five. I get a mark for each one. So let me go back now to my entire question. And when I go back, I notice that the diagram is given. And then look what the memorandum offers. The memorandum shows exactly as I've drawn it. I've got five marks. Well done. Plus my definition that I knew. Grade 12, I'm going towards my distinction. And you can do it. Don't give up and don't give in. Well done. Now the next question, 2.3, says calculate the combined mass 
m of the two blocks. All right. Now, very, very interestingly, let's have a look once again. I'm going to use my visualizer once again. There is my combined mass P and Q. Notice, remember, we were told that they are glued together, right? Let's focus that. They're glued together, and there's my combined mass. So I need to find the combined mass. What I need to do now is I need to ensure that I take the 20 kilogram block into account. The reason for that is there's tension connecting this object as well, but that's not a problem for me. So how do I approach that? Well, let me take up a new piece of paper and then I will do my calculation right now. I will start with my 20 kilogram block because that one is very easy. Remember, I've just drawn my forces in nicely. So what I do in terms of my calculation, I could just label this and say, look, as respects or for the 20 kilogram block, for the 20 kg block, okay? Let's call it that, object, right? Nice to have things organized. Then underline that because then I know exactly how this needs to go. What I need to recognize for the 20 kilogram block, right? I need to look at the horizontal forces that are at play, right? Now, if I look at my diagram, what are the horizontal forces at play? Well, I'm talking about every other force except the normal force and FG. So I do not at this point use FG as well as the normal force, but I certainly am going to use my tension. I certainly am going to use my frictional force and I certainly am going to use my applied force. But I need to start by recognizing that according to Newton's second law, right? I need to state that F net is equal to MA. Right? Very important. So what constitutes my net force? Well, it's going to be my tension, and I'm going to take direction to the right and downwards as positive, right? Because remember, we're dealing with vector principles here. So I'm going to have my tension, which is positive, right? And then I'm going to have my applied force and my frictional force. But as you can see from the diagram, these are not in that same direction. So I'm going to show them in a different direction, right? And so in a real sense, I'm gonna say plus, and then I'll say minus the applied force, right? And then I say plus, and then I say minus, Frictional force. And that is equal to MA. The reason for this is you know that these directions are different. And so, in a very real sense, using the principles of mathematics, what am I frankly dealing with? Well, I'm dealing with a situation that looks like this. Yeah, I've got my tension. I do not know what my tension is, right? And then now, plus multiplied by minus will give me a minus. My applied force, right? Applied force, I am told, is 35. However, I need to recognize that the applied force, the horizontal component of the applied force will involve the cosine ratio. So I'm going to say this is 35 cosine, and the angle that's acting there is 40 degrees. Right, because that's the horizontal component. And then my frictional force, I'm told five newtons, that's going to be minus five, and that's equal to, and I know that because this is stationary there, that's going to be zero. Right, so what am I dealing with here? Let me compute this. If I take my calculator and I say, look, 35 cosine 40 is equal to 26,81. And then uh, if I put, let's say, minus 35 cosine 40, right? And then I say minus 5. What am I dealing with there? 
There you see very nicely, I'm dealing with minus 31,81. All right, so I have here T minus 31,81 is equal to zero. And when I solve for T, my tension is going to be none other than 31,81 Newton. All right, so that's the tension. Okay, fine. But that's only for the 20 kilogram block, right? And that's a help because as I move forward with my calculation, this is really going to help me in a great way. So let me go further. I now need to go for block M. Let me get another piece of paper, right? Because there are two objects, I need to show them individually. So for block M, I need to write the following. The itemize that I'm dealing with block M. For block M. All right, got that. Now I underline that nicely so that everything falls into place very nicely. Once again, I start with F net is equal to M A. Very important because we're dealing with Newton's second law of motion. But now if I look at my block M, what are the forces acting on block M? I've got my tension, but now notice the tension now here is going up. So it's going in this direction. So that tension will be negative now. And then I've got my FG or my weight going down. That's going to be positive. So what is my net force? Well, my net force is basically a combination of the following two. Right? I have to write these in. Remember, it's going to be FG. And then I'm going to say plus, and then I'm going to say minus my tension, right? To show that it's going in a different direction. And that's going to equal MA. And of course, as you know, that is going to be zero as well. Where does this take me? Well, FG is MG. We know that, right? And that's going to be minus my tension. And that's going to equal this MA, which is zero. I might as well put that right now. What is the mass? Well, that's what I'm looking for. So how does this move forward? Well, I say M multiplied by 9,8. Remember, that's on the formula sheet as well, right? And that's the gravitational acceleration minus my tension. I just calculated my tension, the previous step for block, the 20 kilogram block. Remember, my tension was 31,81 Newton. So I simply substitute that in there. And then I say minus 31,81 equal to zero. Right. And as you know, 9,8 multiplied by M will give me 9,8 M. Right. We're just taking it the long way so that you see every step. I'm going to take this negative over, right, using the principles of algebra, and that's going to be 31,81. Now we can solve that. We know what happens in a case like this. We're simply going to divide both sides by 9,8. So why don't we do that, right? I've got fraction button there, as you can see, 31,81 in my numerator and my denominator, 9,8. And I say that's equal to, if I have to find the answer, it, the calculator tells me 3,2459, rounding off to second decimal places. I then finally declare, therefore, right, the mass of the object is 3,25, and my unit for mass is kilogram. Right, there we go. And I declare that very, very nicely. Okay, so there we have it. Right there. Great 12s, just to go through this again with you, because that may have come a bit too fast for you. Firstly, for this calculation, you need to take your 20 kilogram block. Remember, these questions in Physical Sciences Paper 1 are scaffolded. In other words, what is asked in the first part is carried through to the second part, to the third part, and all of that. It's like a building. The foundation is laid, then you have the first floor, the second floor, and so on. So for the 20 kilogram block, I use F net is equal to MA. From that point, I itemize my various forces. And of course, that was drawn 
from the diagram that was actually shown, right? So I'm using these forces this way. The reason why I didn't use these vertical forces is because the question involves a situation where the forces are going in the horizontal direction and downwards. That's why these have got no influence whatsoever, all right? And so the tension minus the applied force, right? Remember the trigonometric ratio there, the horizontal. If that was the vertical, that would have been the sine of 40 degrees. But because it's horizontal, I have to use the cosine ratio. Minus five is equal to zero. And then computing all of this, I get T minus 31,81. I got this minus 31,81 by finding the answer of all of this. And then my tension was 31,81. With that in place, I then went and I looked at block M. There's block M. Once again, I started with F net is equal to MA. And then I showed my forces, looking at the diagram once again, right? They are forces this way. And of course, in a real sense, these are vertical forces, but they are in the same plane, yeah. That's why we have to use them, all right? And so the tension is going up that way, and FG is going down that way there. That's why the sign convention played off here. And there, my G was 9,8. I'm looking for M, so I needed that. There's my tension from the previous step, and I got multiplying these to 9,8 M is equal to 31,81. And when I divide both sides by that, here is my final answer. The mass is 3,25 kilograms. All right, well done. Now, going back to my question, there we have it. Let's see what the memorandum is offering us here. When we look at that, calculate the combined mass. Ah, oh, there we go. All right, so there we are, spot on with the memorandum. We've got our five marks there as well. All right, very good. Now let's look at our next question. And as I mentioned, these questions are scaffolded, all right? Question 2.4 says, right, the 20 kilogram block experiences a frictional force of five Newton as it moves to the right at constant speed. We know that from a previous step. Now we are told, at a certain stage of motion, block Q breaks off and falls down. Hmm, very interesting. So the glue wasn't strong enough. <laughs> now, how will each of the following be affected when this happens? Firstly, the tension in the string. What will happen? Will it increase, decrease, or remain the same? Big 12, the tension will decrease, obviously, because that part of the block came off. Now look at the next question. All right. Right, it will decrease. There we go. That's it. The tension in the string will decrease. Question 2.4.2 says, how will each of the following be affected when this happens? The velocity of the 20 kilogram block. What will happen in that case? Well, to be sure, if you look at the 20 kilogram block, the velocity will decrease. Why? because it will accelerate or the net force, right, will be to the left. And as a result of that, that will cause an entire decreasing of the velocity, all right? Notice what the memorandum offers in this case here, all right? If we have to look, there we have it, okay? So the velocity of the 20 kilogram block will decrease because it will accelerate to the left. In other words, the net force will go in the direction to the left. In our program, we're going to consider an aspect of paper one that is known as vertical projectile motion. Now, you may know that this comes up for examination as question three in physical sciences paper one. And what we really want to do is to gear you up so that you achieve maximum marks during this question in your final paper. We're going to first have a look at some very important points. And these points are definitions 
that apply to vertical projectile motion. Firstly, define the term projectile. Grade 12, here is an interesting and a very important definition. A projectile is an object which has been given an initial velocity and then it moves under the influence of the gravitational force only. You get that? Well done. What about free fall? How do we define the concept free fall? Well, free fall is defined as motion during which the only force acting on an object is the gravitational force. We use the following equations of motion to solve problems involving vertical projectile motion. Now, all of these equations occur on the information sheet, which is found in paper one. Notice this equation. This equation here does not have any mention of a displacement. It's got final velocity is equal to initial velocity plus the acceleration multiplied by the change in time. Then below this, here we have an equation that does not have any mention of time involved. What do we have? Final velocity squared, as we can see, is equal to the initial velocity squared plus twice multiplied by the acceleration and the change in displacement. And of course, we know delta x represents displacement in the horizontal plane, whereas we can write this equation also with delta y when we look at the vertical plane as well, in which case a ball will be thrown up or the projectile moving up. What about the other equations of motion that we find on the information sheet? Here we have another equation. Delta x, which means the displacement, is equal to the initial velocity multiplied by the time plus a half the acceleration multiplied by the change in time squared. So this equation, as you can see, is quadratic in its nature, because there we have t squared, very much like a parabola in mathematics. And if we do it in the horizontal plane, well, we simply substitute a y where we had x before, and there we see the equation is the same. And then finally, if you look at the bottom corner, there we have delta x is equal to initial velocity plus final velocity divided by 2, and that's multiplied by delta time. Did you notice, grade 12, in all our equations of motion, initial velocity always occurs? In other words, there is no equation of motion where we do not have initial velocity in it. All right. So that's been a very good viewing of what we need for where we are going now. Moving on, let us remember, we need to start every calculation in mechanics, including vertical projectile motion, by indicating the sign convention at the beginning of the problem. For example, we must write there, take upwards as positive or take upwards as negative. That is what we call a sign convention. And once we choose a sign convention, we must faithfully stick to that sign convention throughout the duration of that question, right up until we conclude. That's why our next point says we need to keep to one sign convention when solving a problem and do not change your chosen sign convention. Very important, it is for us to remember that the direction of the gravitational acceleration, which is g, does not change in a question. g remains constant. And remember, g, according to the information sheet, has a magnitude of 9,8 meters per second squared downwards. Very important. Then, as we can note, here we see it. Gravitational acceleration is 9,8 meters per second square, and it is always downwards. Even if the object is moving up, the gravitational acceleration is downwards. 
very important principle there. So it's also important for us to be able to interpret and sketch graphs for projectiles, right? These questions come up for three or four marks, generally at the end of the question, after we've done our calculations. So they examine us to see whether we understand the concepts that we have been working with in a question. Let's remember, at the maximum height, the velocity of the object is zero meters per second. Next, when we look at graphical manipulation, here we see a diagram showing a person throwing a ball up into the air. And as it gets to the highest point, we know that the velocity is zero meters per second. And as it comes down, well, there are changes in connection with the velocity, as well as the gravitational acceleration, and also the displacement, very important principle. And so here we have a viewing of the various graphs. Let's remember, grade 12s, that if we are asked to draw a position time graph, that graph belongs to the family of curves. So if we look at these graphs here on the left-hand side, this is a position time graph or displacement time graph, right? They are curves because they are parabolic as well as exponential in nature as well, all right? So a displacement time graph as well as a position time graph will always be a curve. However, the velocity time graph belongs to the family of, as we know in mathematics, y is equal to mx plus c. That's the straight line or the linear function, right? Where you'll have a y-intercept and you'll also have an x-intercept as well. So here we have an example of a velocity time graph. Never does a velocity time graph include a curve. And the same applies for the acceleration time graph. Here we have an acceleration time graph Notice here, the acceleration here is negative. That is minus 9,8 meters per second squared. I personally think that the acceleration time graph is the easiest graph to draw in, me in mechanics because all that is needed is to show the acceleration. If it's negative, it's minus 9,8 meters per second squared, as we see here, a straight line like that. If the acceleration is positive, well, then it's positive 9,8 meters per second squared. So do you get those points, grade 12? To summarize, a position time graph as well as a displacement time graph will always be a curve. What about the velocity time graph and the acceleration time graph? Those graphs will always be straight line graph. Remember, you get marks for the shape of the graph as well. So please keep those points in mind. What are the steps that we should employ or use in the equations? Well, step number one, draw a diagram of the motion of the object. In this connection, I would just like to go across to the visualizer and demonstrate something. Here's my page, right? Suppose we have a ball, right? A boy, let's say, standing on a particular height, maybe a balcony, right? And he throws a ball up into the air. So there we have a balcony. I'm just going to draw it like that. And we're going to have a look at the three concepts that I just mentioned, right? There we have it. This person is standing on this particular balcony, right? So there's the person here. All right, there we go. There's my stick figure. All right, there we go. All right, I'm sure you agree I'm a wonderful artist. <laughs> now, he has a ball in his hand, all right? There's the ball, right, in his hand. Let's make the ball, he's holding the ball. And now what happens, he throws the ball up. This is the trajectory. In other words, it's the motion of the object as he's as it's going along he throws it up and the ball is going to come right down 
right, until it hits the ground. Let's say that's the point where it hits the ground. Right, so if you got the picture, there we have the boy standing on a balcony. He's got this ball, maybe a tennis ball or cricket ball, and he throws this ball up. Great 12, from the minute the ball leaves his hand, what has he done? He has given it an initial velocity. And therefore, the ball moves under the influence of the gravitational force only. It becomes a projectile. When does it become a projectile? The moment it leaves his hand. Right? You got that point? Now, let's look at the velocity. Suppose I say, I take my sign convention as take upwards as positive. We're only going to do this one. Right? Take upwards as positive. Right? And all you need to do in the exam is just to know one sign convention, because if you take upwards as negative, it's exactly the opposite of that. Let's have a look at the velocity. Now, if upwards is taken as positive, the velocity will be positive, 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 positive. The minute it gets to the highest point, we know that the velocity there will be zero meters per second. Okay, I'm just going to put a V plus here so that you see. The velocity, 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 velocity. And I'm going to put an arrow there indicating that this is a vector quantity. Right, have you got the point? So the velocity is positive, 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 positive. And the minute it gets to the highest point here, the velocity is zero meters per second. We've established that in, a, in this program already. And then from this point down to the bottom, the velocity is negative, 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 right? So what are we saying? Negative velocity, negative velocity, negative velocity, negative velocity, there we go, right? And this is also negative here, and finally, negative. So that is, these are the rules in connection with working with mechanics calculation. Right, so that's our velocity. To summarize, if upwards is taken as positive, your velocity needs to be positive, 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 zero meters per second, negative, 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 negative. Please keep that in mind because this will influence our calculations. What about the acceleration? Now that is obviously the easiest of the lot, right? If upwards is taken as positive, grade 12, your acceleration is negative 9,8 throughout the trajectory of the projectile. In other words, the trajectory means that's the path followed by the projectile. So you're going to have minus 9,8, minus 9,8, minus, 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 minus. Please keep that in mind. So we're going to have G, right? That's minus 9,8, minus G. I'm going to say minus. Minus, 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 and so the story goes, right? We're just mapping out all these important points here because these are going to help us in our calculation. And remember, I'll just write on the side, right, that G has a magnitude of minus 9,8. Meters per second squared. Right, there we go. Minus 9,8 meters per second squared. Downwards. Downwards. Okay, just keep that in mind. Because it's a vector quantity. Downwards. Okay. Right. We are concerned about its direction as well. So, Minus 9,8, minus 9,8, minus 9,8, minus 9,8, minus 9,8, minus, 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 minus. All right, so there we have our velocity and we have our gravitational acceleration. Well, what about the displacement? Now watch very carefully. 
for the displacement, what I'm going to do, I'm going to take my ruler and I'm going to draw a line, grade 12s, because as you know from term one when you did mechanics, right, if you draw a line, this line here will represent the line that represents the starting point of where the object becomes a projectile. All right, there's the line right here. Okay, the line is in blue. So what do we have? Well, because it's vertical projectile motion, I'm going to use a Y. So Y, 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 right on top here, Y, Y, Y. This is positive, 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 positive. Positive. Even on top here, I'm going to, just for emphasis, say that that's positive, right? Positive displacement there, right? And, and remember, displacement is a vector quantity. That's why I'm showing them with arrows. But right in line with where the object started or left the boy's hand, this Y here will be zero meters. That stands to reason, doesn't it? Because if it goes up, maybe it goes two meters up in the air, it's going to come back to two meters. So the displacement is up that way and down this way. It's zero right here. And from this point, it becomes negative. 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 Until it comes right down to the ground. Have we got that grade 12? Very, very important. So here we have our various concepts. Remember, this applies to if we take the sign convention, take upwards as positive. Very important. To summarize, if upwards is taken as positive, what can we say about the velocity? Well, velocity here is positive, 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 zero meters per second, negative, 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 negative. What about the gravitational acceleration? 9,8 meters per second squared. Negative, 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 negative 9,8 throughout the trajectory or the journey of the projectile. And then the displacement, as you can see in blue, positive, 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 zero meters, right? Because it's right in line with the starting point. Then negative, 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 negative. If upwards is taken as negative, all you need to do is change these signs, in which case it will be negative, 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 zero, positive, 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 positive. G will be positive, 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 and so the story goes. What about displacement? It's going to be negative, 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 zero, positive, 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 positive. All right? So all you do is you'll toggle this, right? And then you take it from there. We are going to need this plan and we're going to work the plan later on. All right, so please keep that in mind. That is very, very important. So let's go back to our PowerPoint now, now that we've established those very important points. So after we've drawn a diagram showing the motion of the object, why we need to move on and we need to choose a positive direction and use the same convection, convention throughout. I've just illustrated that by means of my diagram. Then we need to record the information given and the value required, whether it's unknown or whether it's known, by writing it next to each variable. Make sure you check the unit and the direction. And then you need to select the correct equation and solve for the unknown quantity. Remember, grade 12 is very important. Always answer your question. And grade 12, do not fall into the trap of thinking, oh, well, I don't know what to actually do. Let me just write down a formula from the formula sheet. At least I'll get one mark. No, you'll get no marks whatsoever. You must write out a formula. Then you must show your complete substitution into that formula. And then you must show an answer with the unit for the door for marking to be opened. Please keep those points in mind. I know your teachers have stressed this point, 
but we'd like to reinforce this point with you as well, right? So you start with the formula as it appears on the formula sheet, then substitute into that formula and then work that out so that you have your answer with a unit and then you'll get your marks. Don't forget to include the units and direction in your answers. Sometimes they say, determine the magnitude. Well, in that case, you don't need to write down the direction. But more often than not, vector quantities must always have a direction because that carries a mark as it is. Very important. So if we are asked to use a reference point when drawing graphs of motion, notice the graph on the left-hand side. If we choose the point from which the object is thrown as the origin of our coordinate system, then the graph will look like that. In other words, it will be from the zero to the highest point and then come down. Take note, that's a position time graph. And as I stressed, it is a curve. Look at the next one. If we choose the center or to center our coordinate system at the point, where the object lands, then the graph will look like that. So now we go higher on the x-axis. We're still going up to the highest point, but then we're coming right down because we're concerned about where the object is landing. All right, so please keep those points in mind. And as you review this video, make sure you get all these concrete points firmly in gear so that you can get maximum marks as you move along. Now it's time for us to tackle a question that was found in the November 2020 paper. This was question three. The question simply read, a small ball is dropped from a height of two meters and bounces a few times after landing on a cement floor. Right? So there we are told the height is two meters. So what I'm going to do, I'm going to get my page out, and then I'm going to itemize things nicely. Moving across to the visualizer, what do we itemize? Well, we are told that the height is two meters. So I'm going to write that down. I know that because this is vertical projectile motion, right? I'm going to take my G as minus 9,8 meters per second squared. And I know that that will be downward because I plan to take upwards as positive, right? So notice I'm planning my work because I want to work my plan. That's the motto that we need to keep in mind because this is gonna take us to success. Right, let's go back to the question now. Question then says, the position time graph below, not drawn to scale, represents the motion of the ball. Oh, lovely. They give us the position time graph. All right, now let's see what's happening. Well, can you see here, grade 12, there you have the two meters. And so the ball has dropped from there and it comes down. Notice it takes 0 0.64 seconds, if you look at this, 0 0.64 seconds, and then it bounces. But now notice there's a time delay, one can say. And then at 0 0.67, it goes up again to another height, and then it comes down to 1,90. Then there's a bit of a time delay, because this is the time axis. And then at 1,97, it goes up. Notice the height is dropping all the time. And then it comes down to another value, which we simply know as t. And we know that this value will obviously be greater than 1,97. Well. Question 3.1, define the term free fall. Do you remember the definition of free fall? Yes, I know you remember. It is motion of an object under the influence of the gravitational force only. That's the definition of free fall, right? Once again, motion of an object under the influence of the gravitational force only. You get two marks for that. Very, very important. Now we move on to question 3.2. The question says, 
use the graph. Notice we need to use the graph and determine the time that the ball is in contact with the floor before the first bounce. Okay, 12, this is a very interesting question. Do you notice it bounces here at 0, 0.64 and then here there's 0, 0.67. So what we are being asked to find out, if I go across to my page, there's my page, I have my plan. I simply need to say, look, the time is equal to, remember, 0, 0.64. I actually have a copy of the question right here. If you look at this, there it is, 0, 0.67. I need to take 0, 0.67 and then I need to subtract it from 0, 0.64. So in other words, 0, 0.67 minus 0, 0.64. How do I write that out? Well, there's my time. And let me say change in time, right? Delta T is equal to 0, 0.67, as you saw there. And I'm going to say minus 0, 0.64. So what do I get when I have that? Well, here's my calculator. Switch my calculator on, 0, 0.67 minus 0, 0.64. What is my answer now? Well, my answer is none other than 0, 0.03 seconds. And that's what I write down. That's equal to 0, 0.03 seconds. Very, very easy. In other words, that is the time that the ball is in contact with the floor before the first bounce. All right, so let's keep that in mind. That's the answer there. I'm sure you've got that in your calculation as well. Moving back to our question, right? Let's see, ah, there we have it. Notice that's what the memorandum offers. We've got two marks for that. Isn't that wonderful? Well done, grade 12s. I know you are benefiting from the review of this particular question in connection with mechanics. Keep it up. Remember, don't give up and don't give in. Let's go on now. The next question says, right? Te determine the time it takes. Oops, I think I just jumped the gun here. Determine the time it takes for the ball to be in contact or to reach to reach its maximum height. Let's go. Just one second. There we go. All right, determine the time it takes for the ball to reach its maximum height after the first bounce. So what we are actually calculating is we're calculating this height here, all right? But now we're not calculating the height. The question says, determine the time it takes for the ball to reach its maximum height. Now, there are many options that we can use here. Notice what we are given here. Here we have the time. So if we take 1,90 and we say minus 0, 0,67, in other words, we take this time value minus that, we're finding the average divided by 2. We're going to get 0, 0,62. Let's prove that on the calculator. All right. Notice we take our fraction button, right? As you can see here, I've got my calculator here. If I take fraction button 1,9 minus 0, 0.67, and I divide that by 2. In other words, I'm finding the average. What is my answer? My answer is none other than 0, 0.615. There you can see it nicely. And if you round that off to the second decimal place, you're going to get 0, 0.62. All right. So let me write that out. How will that look? Well, it will look like this. I'm going to say delta time. is equal to, there's my fraction button, 1,90 minus 0, 0,67. All right, there we have it. Paint, get another pen, just so that this is nice and clear. You can see very nicely, 0, 0,67. All right, that's much nicer. And then I have to divide that by two. And as you remember, there I have my 0, 0,62 seconds. That's rounded off to the second decimal place, of course. All right, so there we have that. That 
is the time it takes for the ball to reach its maximum height, right? After the first bounce. Great Charles, why are we taking, you may say, right? Your question could be, why are we taking 1,90? And why are we taking 0, 0,67? Well, there's the ball at the two meter height at the beginning of the question. It comes down to the ground. It took 0, 0,67, 0, 0,64 seconds to reach the ground. Then we know after 0, 0,3 seconds, 0, 0,03 seconds, being in contact with the ground, it then bounces. This is the first bounce and it goes up there and it comes down. The question is about the time it takes for the ball to reach the maximum height. Hence, we have to take these two values here because the question revolves around this particular segment of the graph here. And that's why we come to this answer, 0, 0,62 seconds. Very, very important. I'm sure you're following that nicely. Now, moving across to the next part of our question, we need to determine the speed at which the ball leaves the floor after the first bounce. Right? The speed with which the ball leaves the floor after the first bounce. Now, what are we looking for? We're actually looking for an initial velocity. So what have we got? Have we got final velocity? Yes, the final velocity is zero. Have we got the initial velocity? No, we're looking for that. Have we got G? Well, if we go across to our page now, here we have what we've got. We've got our G, right, which is the gravitational acceleration, which is minus 9.8 meters per second squared. Notice how I can find this. We need to find the speed at which the ball leaves the floor after the first bounce. Now, we know very well that final velocity is equal to initial velocity plus A delta T. This is a formula that occurs on the formula sheet. Do we know the final velocity? Oh, yes, we do. This is zero. Why do we know it's zero? Because the height, right? Remember, looking at our graph here, remember this particular situation? At its highest point, the velocity is zero meters per second. So we can assume that that is zero. We are looking for the initial velocity, right? Plus the acceleration. The acceleration is gravitational acceleration, right? Makes no difference if you put an A or G here. It's one in the same concept. Minus 9,8. So I'm going to put in brackets, minus 9,8. Right. What is the time? Well, we calculated the time, 0, 0,62. Notice the scaffolding of this question. So I say here, yeah, 0, 0,62. Seconds. And of course, I leave out the unit there. Now, let's take the calculator and let us work this out. If I had to take my calculator and I say, look, minus 9,8 multiplied by 0, 0,62, what am I going to get? I'm going to get 6,076. But that's negative, as you can see, right? Negative. When I take that negative concept over, it becomes positive. And if I round this off to the second decimal place, it's going to be 6,08, right? Very important. But let me not jump the gun. Let me take it slowly just so that you clearly understand. So I'm going to have 0 is equal to VI minus, because this is going to give me a minus. There's the proof right here. I'm going to have 6,076. Right, if I now have to solve for the initial velocity, remember I take this over using the principles of algebra, therefore my final answer is the velocity, the initial velocity, is going to be rounded off to the second decimal place, 6,08, and my unit, I'm just going to write it below because I don't have space to write it here, meters per second. There's my answer. I underline that 
and I declare that as my final answer. Right. So there we have a grade 12. Question 3.2.3. The speed at which the ball leaves the floor after the first bounce is none other than 6,08. Now, once again, just to show you the solution. Right? You start with your final velocity is equal to the initial velocity plus the acceleration delta t. That's the formula on the formula sheet. We know that at its highest point, the final velocity is zero. We are looking for the initial velocity. G is minus 9,8 meters per second squared. There you see it right here. And there our time, we calculated it here, 0, 0,62. We simply substitute here. When we substitute all of that, we'll get the answer. Initial velocity is 6,08 meters per second. So what does the memorandum offer? Well, if we look very carefully, that's exactly what the memorandum offers us, right? Upwards as positive, there's our sign convention, and we take it from there. Now, there are various options that can be employed, right? If you take downwards as positive, you'll come to the same answer. The only difference is you will have to change your signs. Remember what I said? When looking at this particular situation here, if you go for take downwards as positive, right? In which case upwards will be negative. Your signs will have to change in line with this plan that we have here. All right. So once again, you'll get exactly what we've got. Well done. All right. And we can move on. I mean, there are various ways to actually do that. Once again, you can see the time is exactly the same. The initial velocity works out to exactly the same. All right, now let's look at our next question, 3.2.4. That question said, we must find the time t indicated on the graph. Notice there we have the t right here. So what do we have? What do we have to really guide us? Well, we have a number of things that basically can guide us, okay? If we think very carefully, right, what have we got? We can use a number of formulae, right? If you notice, I'm just going across to my page here, and then we're going to take it from there. Right. If I had to take the formula u squared, right? In other words, what I do is I take my final velocity squared. Remember, upwards is positive. That is my sign convention. If I had to take vf squared is equal to vi squared plus 2a delta y, right, for the horizontal plane of the vertical plane, I do beg your pardon, the y. Well, I know that at the highest point, the final velocity is going to be zero. So I put that in right there, right? Remember, I'm looking now for the initial velocity, right? And as a result of that, I'm going to go in a different direction because I'm looking for the time. So what are we saying? So there we have that. And then I say, look, my initial velocity, I don't know what that is. So at that moment, I'm going to say that plus two, the acceleration. Remember, this is minus 9,8 and delta Y is 1,2. Right. That's my delta y, 1,2. Where do I get 1,2 from? Well, if I look at my diagram, there you see on the diagram, that is the highest point. That position is 1,2 meters. It's the highest point here. All right. So this particular uh, equation that I'm using is going to result in a two-step process. Right. What am I finding? I'm finding the initial velocity. When I compute all of that, Right? Notice what's going to happen. I'm going to say 2 multiplied by minus 9,8 multiplied by 1,2. And what do I get there? I get minus 23,52. As you can see there, minus 23,52. Let's autofocus nicely so that you see. Right. However, that's a negative. So I take that over, and that's going to become positive. When I take that over, I'm going to have 
the following, just to take it nice and slow so that you follow me nicely, minus 23,52. Right, so therefore, we can say that V is equal to the square root of 23,52. I hope that didn't come too quickly for you. Let me show you what I mean by that. If I take this over, do you agree that V squared will be equal to 23,52? Then I have to find the square root of this particular number. All right, so let me do that. I take my calculator and I say the square root of 23,52. What is the answer now? The answer is 4,85. Can you see that? Rounded off to the second decimal place. So the initial velocity, right, is 4,85 meters per second, right? But the question said, determine the time it takes. Well, that's easy now. All I do now, that's the first part. I've got this initial velocity. I can use another formula. So I take my paper and I use the formula that says delta y, because I'm going to use that 4,85. Delta y is equal to the initial velocity. I've just worked that out, delta t, plus a half gravitational acceleration. Remember, that's a. And then I'm going to have delta t squared. Remember, this formula is on the formula sheet. Right. So what do I substitute? Delta y. I know that this is going to be 1, comma. Two. Now remember that becomes positive. Why does it become positive? Because of this particular rule here when upwards is positive. Positive, 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 positive. That's why that's positive. All right. So that's why this is positive. I can actually put a purposeful plus here. All right. To show that I'm faithful to the law. Then my initial velocity, notice here, the initial velocity is also going to be positive, 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 right? So therefore, that initial velocity, which is what I've just calculated in the previous step, here is 4,85. So I'm going to take that. I'm going to say, look, this is 4,85. And that's positive as well. And then I'm going to multiply that by T. Right? Plus a half. I know that the G is minus 9,8, and then I'm going to have T squared, right? T squared. So what do I have now? Well, I've got this very interesting situation. I've got a quadratic equation. Can you believe it? Can you believe how the tools of mathematics are helping us here? So I've got here a half, which is 0, 0,5, and I'm going to multiply that by 9,8. What do I get? 4,9. So I've got here minus 4,9t squared. Then I've got here that's equal to 4,85t. And then I've got here 1,2, right? 1,2. Now, grade 12, I can do the following. Let me take all of this over and I say this is going to be 4,9 t squared, take this one over, it's going to become minus 4,85 t, and then that is positive, so that's going to be plus 1,2, and that's equal to 0. When I put that into the, if I have a look at this, do you not agree that I can use the quadratic formula for this? Yes, remember, mathematics is the toolbox for physical sciences. So, the quadratic formula states that t will be equal to, right? I'm going to have my fraction button here. And then I'm going to have minus b. Remember, minus b is minus 4,85. Plus or minus the square root. That's why we stress that the physical science candidate must do pure mathematics. Because this is where the advantage of using principles of mathematics in physics really play off nicely. So I'm going to have b squared, which is minus 4,85. And I must square that. Minus 
4, A is 4, 9, and C is 1, 2. Let me just extend my square root sign because I want my marks nicely, and that is divided by 2, and A is 4, 9. All right. Now, you know what? This looks all very complicated, but it's not because the calculator has been waiting to number crunch what we've got. Once again, this is my A. This is like saying AX squared plus BX plus C is equal to zero, the quadratic function. So let me put it in on the calculator. There we go. There's my fraction button. I've got minus brackets, minus 4,85. Close my bracket. Plus, let me take the plus first, square root. Right, then I have minus 4,85, and I mustn't forget to square that. But remember, the discriminant is b squared minus 4ac. Right, you remember from nature of roots in mathematics as well, and so that's all very important. So we go that at the bottom, we have 2 multiplied by 4,9. When we put that in, what do we get? Notice we get an answer that says a half. All right. So we get our t value, t is equal to 0, 0,5, and we say seconds, or. Now, we go up again here, as you know, with the quadratic formula. Ooh, I lost that. Anyway, that's no problem. I'll just do it again. So the fraction button, once again, I'm going to have minus brackets, minus 4, 85, close brackets, minus now, don't forget that. Then I have my square root sign, and I have my b, which is minus 4,85, all squared, minus 4, round bracket, 4,9, close bracket. Then I have another one, 1, 2, and I go down to the bottom, 2, multiply by 4,9, all squared. What is my answer now? There I have my very interesting value. There I have 0, 0,4895. Eight, let's call it that, okay? Or T is equal to 0, 0,489. Okay, let's call it that. All right. Now, if you look at these two, you don't agree that these are in the ballpark, right? They're very close to one another. In fact, if you round that off to the first decimal place, you basically going to have that. So let me take this value here. I'm now going to take this value. And what I need to do now is I need to take this value and I need to add it to 1,97. You may say, why add it? Well, very interestingly, this is why we need to add it. If you look at our graph once again, and we're going back to the graph, and that's why this looks very complicated and looks very long, but it's actually not. Very interesting. Our time value, right? If we look at our time, we're going to have 1,97 seconds plus twice, notice, there's our value, 0, 0,489, close our brackets, right, and then I'm going to talk about why we're using that, take that again, 1,97 plus twice brackets, 0, 0,489, close brackets, and there we have our answer, which is 2,948. All right, T is equal to 2,948. Round that off to the second decimal place. Therefore, time is equal to 2,95 seconds. All right, <clears throat> there we have it. That is our final answer. Now, you may be saying, just hang on, just hang on. Where does this 1,97 come from? And why 2 multiplied by that? Well, do you not agree that there are two values here? Right? Keep that in mind. But let's go back to our graph. There's our graph right here. Can you see 1,97? There you have 1,97. Right? That 1,97, right? And... What we're doing here, why do we say twice? Because of the principle of time symmetry. Remember to go up from here to go here, that's basically half the time. And then from here to go there is another. That's why we multiply it by two. 
okay? And then that brings us to 2,95 seconds. And I think you can appreciate that if you look at the graph, obviously this value here would be 2,95. Because if that is 1,97, this more likely is 2,95. And that is what the memorandum offers. Regardless of which route we take, in other words, what our sign convention is, if you look at this upwards as positive, we've gone this route on the right-hand side, and that's why we've got our answer. In this segment, we're going to focus on a topic that comes up for examination in paper one, namely momentum and impulse. Generally speaking, this is question four in paper one. And so there are some very important definitions as well as principles, as well as other concepts that you really need to master in order to get full marks for this question. And we know that you can do it. So let's go straight in and see what lies ahead for us. Firstly, momentum is defined as the product of an object's mass and its velocity. Very important, okay? The product of an object's mass and its velocity. And that's given by the formula P is equal to mv. Newton's second law in terms of momentum states, the net or resultant force acting on an object is equal to the rate of change of momentum of the object in the direction of the net force. And there we see the formula F net is equal to delta P over delta T. So let's not forget that. F net is equal to delta P over delta T. Moving on, impulse. How do we define impulse? Well, impulse is defined as the product of the resultant or net force acting on an object and the time the net force acts on the object. An impulse is given by the equation F net delta T is equal to delta P. And then of course, if we expand that delta P, well, F net delta T is equal to M delta V. What's also very important is for us to know how we can apply and explain the concepts of impulse as it relates to safety considerations in everyday life. For example, airbags, seatbelts, and arrestor beds. Very important. Now, at this juncture, let us just go across to our visualizer and let's talk about how this all plays off. Remember the formula that we just established? We had F net is equal to delta P, you may remember, over delta T. All right, so there's our formula. And let me put this in fractional format. Now the question often comes up in an exam. Explain using the impulse momentum theorem how airbags or seatbelts prove life-preserving in the event of a motor car accident. Well, very, very interestingly. You see, grade 12, here is what the impulse momentum theorem states. It's given by this formula, F net delta T is equal to delta P, right? We're just making F net the subject of the formula. When the time taken is increased, notice I'm going to put an arrow going up, it's increased. There's nothing we can do about the change in momentum. In other words, this remains constant the net force will decrease. As a result of that, that will prove to be life-preserving. Now, take, for example, seatbelts in a car. The reason why we put seatbelts on is because in the event of an accident, as you know, the passenger could go forward, hit the windscreen, and even be killed, sadly. Well, the seatbelt increases the time for the passenger 
to hit the windscreen. So in other words, the time taken is increased. There's nothing we can do about the knock. In other words, the impulse, the crash, whatever it is, the collision is going to happen. So that remains constant. But the net force decreases. In other words, the person may not hit the windscreen with a powerful force if this was not increased. So have you got this clearly? When the time taken is increased, the change in momentum remains constant, your net force decreases. The same is true with an airbag, same principle. The time taken is increased, the change in momentum is constant, the net force is decreased. And that's why many items that shops sell to us have polystyrene wrappers. You know polystyrene, right? That white material. It's because if that item drops, the time taken for it to hit the ground is increased. The change in momentum remains constant. That's the drop or the knock. And as a result, the net force decreases, which could prove to be preserving for that particular item, whether it's glass or whatever material it's really made of. Right. So remember the principles embodied in the impulse momentum theorem. Very, very important. This comes up for examination in the grade 12 syllabus. Moving back to our PowerPoint, as we see at the bottom, when the time of the impact is increased, we just went through that. For a constant change in momentum, the force on the object is decreased or reduced, one can say. And so in a very real sense, when we move on, we come to what is called the principle of conservation of linear momentum. Now, the principle of conservation of linear momentum states that the total linear momentum of an isolated system remains constant or is conserved. What do we mean by an isolated system in physics? Simply put, it is a system on which the net external force is zero. Remember, you must state your positive direction when performing calculations. And so very importantly, also examined is whether collisions are elastic or inelastic. How do we determine whether a collision is elastic? Simply put, we calculate the total kinetic energy in its initial format. So we take both objects, and as you know, from grade 10, kinetic energy is given by the formula Ek is equal to a half mv squared. You look at the first object plus the second object's kinetic energy, find the sum of them, that's in the initial phase, and then you take the final kinetic energy, and then you add them together, and there you find it. If the initial kinetic energy is equal to the final kinetic energy, why then the collision is elastic. If the initial kinetic energy is not equal to the final kinetic energy, then the collision is inelastic. Please keep that point in mind. That is very, very important. And that comes up for examination as well. Well, what should we remember in connection with impulse and momentum? Both of them are vector quantities. And as such, they are physical quantities that have both magnitude and direction. Important indeed. State your positive direction when performing calculations. Also, the SI unit measurement for momentum is the kilogram meter per second. And for impulse, it's the Newton second. Now let's find out how did we derive that? Well, you remember we defined momentum, right? P is equal to MV. Let me ask you this question. What is the SI unit for mass? Yes, I can hear you saying it. You are saying the SI unit for mass is none other than the kilogram. And you're right. What is the SI unit for velocity? 
none other than meter per second, right? So momentum has the SI unit, kilogram meter per second. What about impulse? Well, there we know. Remember the formula? F net delta T is equal to delta P. What is the SI unit for force or net force? None other than the Newton. What is the SI unit for time? None other than second. So the SI unit for impulse is the Newton second. Please keep that in mind because you'll notice in our program, these SI units play off. To summarize, SI unit for momentum is the kilogram meter per second. SI unit for impulse is the Newton second. This is how we derive these points. And these often come up for examination, even in question one, because they are very important concepts. Right, moving back to our PowerPoint, let's now move forward in our program and have a look at a question that was drawn from the November 2020 paper. This was question four in connection with momentum. Right? I just need to get my page here and then we'll itemize the various points because we are heading for some interesting calculations as well. Notice what we are told. The question says, ball P of mass 0, 0,16 moving east at a speed of 10 meters per second. Hang on, let's stop right there. All right, we got ball P. So let's go across to our page and let's itemize. We are told that ball P, and on the side, I'm gonna say here yeah, ball, there we have it, right? And we're going to itemize some very important principles here. Ball P. What are we told in connection with ball P? Well, we are told, and I have a copy of the question right here with me, right? There's the question paper from 2020. We are told that ball P has a mass of 0, 0,16. So the mass is 0, 0,16 kilograms. Remember, that's a scalar quantity, has magnitude only, no direction. And then we are told it's moving east. That's the first direction mentioned based on the directional arrows that we see here. So let's take out a sign convention straight away, right? Let's leave that there and let's write here, take east as positive. Take east, I'm just gonna put this in caps. So that we see how this goes, right? East as positive. Very important principle, right? East as positive. And then what I do is I underline that because that is going to fine tune my entire calculation, right? I'm going to say take East as positive, right? So now we come back. The question is telling us here that this ball P is moving at a speed of 10 meters per second. So the velocity here, right, I'm going to say is plus because east is positive, 10 meters per second. All right, so I'm going to leave it there as it is. Now the question continues to say, this ball P collides head on with another ball Q. And we are told now that ball Q has a mass of 0, 0,2 kilograms. It's moving west, so it's going to get negative with a speed of 15 meters per second. Well, let's write that in. So I come back to my page where I'm planning my work because I'm going to work my plan just now. So ball Q, right? As we know, Ball Q, we are told that ball Q, our question says, has a mass of 0, 0,2 kilogram. So I'm going to write here M is equal to 0, 0,2 kg. And then this is moving west. 
at 15 meters per second. So the velocity here is going to be minus 15 meters per second. All right, there we go. Here we have board P, with a mass of 0, 0,16 kilogram. The velocity is positive 10 meters per second. Board Q, the mass is 0, 0,2 kilogram, and its velocity is minus 15 meters per second. Now, let's go back to our question. Question states, after collision, ball P moves west with a speed of five meters per second. So I go back to my ball P section and I say, after collision, I'm just gonna put this in red. I just underline that. We are told after collision, it moves west with a velocity of five meters per second. So what does that really mean? Well, there's my velocity minus five meters. Right. Can you see that? That's minus five meters per second because that's west. Remember, we're taking east as positive. Now, they say to us, as shown in the diagram below, and there we see our diagram, we are told, ignore the effects of friction and the rotational effects of the balls. All right, fine. So there we see it all clearly sketched. Question 4.1, very, very interesting. A definition. Remember grade 12s, your definitions are so important. You can get so many marks if you learn these definitions from the examination guidelines. How would you define the term momentum? I can hear you saying it. I can hear you saying it. You're right. Momentum is defined as the product of the object's mass and its velocity. Well done. Two marks for you. Once again, the momentum is defined as the product of an object's mass and its velocity. Now, question 4.2.1 says we must calculate, right? Calculate the velocity of ball Q after collision. This is very interesting and very easy to do. Okay, 12s, here we go. Watch very carefully. Notice I've got my plan. I need to work my plan. But before I do that, I need to take out my sign convention. I've done that already, right? So I've fine tuned everything. Now I can launch forth by using a formula on the formula sheet. And the formula that the formula sheet tells me is sigma, right? You remember that from number patterns in mathematics, sigma, momentum initial should be equal to sigma, the sum of the final momentum. All right, can you see that? The initial momentum should be equal to the final momentum. What are we talking about when we do that? Well, we mean the following. If we take the various balls, look, there's ball P here. So let's take the mass of ball P multiplied by the velocity of ball P. And we say that's the initial phase plus the mass of ball Q and multiplied by the velocity of ball Q initially that should equal the mass of ball P, the velocity of ball P, and that is in its final phase, plus the mass of Q multiplied by the velocity of Q, and that is also in its final phase as well. All right, can you see that? Now, very important. Here, I've got my formula that is on the formula sheet, I then have expanded that formula. All I need to do now is to substitute into this particular formula. How does that look if I do that? Well, let's do this. What is the mass of ball P? There's the mass right here, 0, 0,16. So I simply say, look, that's 0, 0,16. I'm going to multiply that by the velocity, and that's 10, positive 10. You can see that, like that, plus. What's the mass of Q? There's the mass of Q here, 0, 0,2. What is the velocity of Q? There it is here, 50, minus 50. Don't forget the minus. That's very, very important. And that's equal to, 
Don't forget the equal to sign. The mass of P, we had that already, 0, 0,16. Velocity of P after, that's minus 5. Don't forget that. And then plus the mass of Q is 0, 0,2. And the velocity of Q. We don't know what that is. That's what we're actually finding. The question says, calculate the velocity of the, right? The velocity of Q of the, we don't know what that is. So that's why I'm going to leave this blank because that's what we're finding, right? So in a real sense, we're looking for multiplied by V Q final like that all right so we've got all of this nicely organized i now take my calculator and let me find the product of each of these sets of brackets there we go 0 0.16 multiplied by 10 as you know is none other than 1.6 right so i'm going to put here 1.6 then i have 0 0.2 multiplied by minus 15 0 0.2 multiplied by minus 15 there we have it Answer, negative three. That's my left-hand side. Then I have my equal to sign, right? Let me find the product of these two numbers. I've got here 0, 0.16 multiplied by negative five. What do I get? None other than minus 0, 0.8, as you can see. Minus 0, 0.8. And then I have a coefficient here, which is 0, 0.2. And I say B. Q final. All right, there we go. Now, using the principles of algebra, you know very well that in algebra, we need to bring this minus over, right? So we've got here minus one, comma, sorry, one comma six. Let's put it like that. Let's see how we can do this. One comma six. Okay, there we go. One comma six. I do beg your pardon for that. Minus three. Right, that's these two numbers. And then we're going to bring this minus 8 over, and that's going to be plus 0, 0,8. And that's going to equal 0, 0,2 BQF. All right. Take note that this is 1,6. All right. So we take our calculator now. 1,6 minus 3 plus 0, 0,8. What is our answer? None other than minus 0, 0,6. So we've got here minus 0, 0,6. And that's equal to 0, 0,2 BQ final. Now you know this coefficient, right? To find BQF, we must divide both sides by 0, 0,2. And therefore, BQF is equal to, we take minus 0, 0,6, divided by 0, 0,2. I still have minus 0, 0,6 on my calculator divided by 0, 0,2. The answer is none other than negative 3. So the velocity is minus 3 meter per second. But the question says write down the velocity. That's not the final answer. The final answer is the velocity is 3 meters per second That's it. And the negative indicates west because east is positive, hence west is negative. And so there is my final answer. Okay, three meters per second west. Once again, grade 12s, let's go through this just so that you see exactly what we've done. Step number one, <clears throat> take out your sign convention. Take east as positive. And of course, you know what? You could take east as negative. It will work out to the same answer as long as you are faithful to your convention as you're going through your information. Then you itemize everything for ball P, right? The mass, the velocity, notice that's positive because it's east. Afterwards, we are told it's going west, hence that becomes negative. For ball Q as well, same principle. And then we start with the formula on the formula sheet. We expand that out nicely. Then we substitute into the formula and we make sure we don't make a mistake by being faithful to the algebraic principles that will bring us to our final answer. 
And here is the final answer. When we have a negative, we now interpolate that. In other words, we interpret that as being the westerly direction because of the negative, since the sign convention said, take east as positive. Well done. Do you know that we've got five marks for that? Well, let's see what the memorandum offers. When we go into that, there we see it. That's what the memorandum offers. All very nice. Okay, so there we have that all nice and clear. Now the next question says to us, determine the magnitude of the impulse on ball P during collision. Now we're not talking about ball Q. We are only concerned about ball P. So here's my paper again. We know from the formula sheet that if we have to look at momentum, remember the sign convention is still take east as positive, right? Impulse, as we know, is represented in physics as delta P. In other words, the change in momentum, right? And delta P, right? Impulse, as we know from the formula sheet, F net delta T is equal to delta P. Right. But we're not too concerned about this segment. We're looking at this delta P. Now we know that delta P, right, can be represented as M, that's the mass, multiplied by the velocity of ball P in its final format minus the velocity of ball P in its initial format, right? That's how we can find it. Well, what is the mass of ball P? The mass of ball P is 0, 0,16. What is the final velocity? Well, afterwards we are told it's negative five. What is the, its initial format? We are told it's positive 10. So we're gonna use these three concepts in our calculation right here. How will that look? Very easy. What we do, the mass as we know is 0, 0,16 brackets, and then the final is minus five, and then the minus is part of the formula, and then we have the 10, which is positive like that. When we put that into the calculator, what will we get? Remember, we have minus 0, 0,16, 0, 0,16 brackets, minus five, minus 10, close brackets. The answer that we get is none other than negative 2,4, all right? So we are given here negative 2,4. So what does that really mean for us? We can now finally conclude, therefore, delta P is equal to 2,4 Newton second. Right, you got that? That is what we can conclude in connection with this. That is the magnitude of the impulse. And that's what we were asked to calculate, right? Have you got that once again? Don't forget that delta P is M V final minus V initial. And there we substitute and we get our answer right there. When we look back at what the, calc the uh, memorandum offers, there we see it. If west is negative, there we have our answer, 2,4 Newton second. And even if we take it in the different direction, we'll get exactly the same point. In our program, we're going to examine work, energy, and power. Now, as you know, in paper one, this oftentimes is a challenging question for many learners. And yet it is so interesting and it's so easy if we just apply our minds to the principles that we're going to review right now. So why don't we do that? Let's start right at the very beginning. The definition of work is the work done by an object or on an object by a constant force is given as F delta X cosine theta, where F represents the magnitude of the force. Delta X, the magnitude of the displacement. Theta is the angle between the force and the displacement. And hence the formula, 
W standing for work done is equal to F delta X cosine theta. We need to remember that positive or the net total work done is an indication that the kinetic energy is increasing. That's a very important detail. Please do not forget that. The work energy theorem states, the work done on an object by a net force is equal to the change in the object's kinetic energy. And so there are three formulae that we find on our formula sheet in this connection. Notice the bullet points that are itemized on this slide. Firstly, W net is equal to delta EK. Next, W net is equal to, we know that delta means final minus initial. Well, in a real sense, this is final EK minus initial EK. And then we can further expand that. W net is equal to a half MV squared final minus a half MV squared initial all bringing together W net is equal to delta EK. What is meant by a conservative force? Well, a conservative force is a force for which the work done in moving an object between two points is independent of the path taken. In a real sense, we can say that conservative forces are path independent forces. Examples of conservative forces are the gravitational force, the electrostatic force in a spring, as well as electrostatic forces, which are also known as Coulombic forces. What about the non-conservative force? How would we define that? Well, a non-conservative force is defined as a force for which the work done in moving an object between two points depends on the path taken. Hence, non-conservative forces are path-dependent forces. Examples, friction, air resistance, and tension in a court. Have you got those examples of non-conservative forces? Frictional force, air resistance, and tension in a court. Now, when non-conservative forces are present, we can use this beautiful formula. I love using this formula in my calculations. WNC, that stands for the work done by the non-conservative forces, is equal to delta EK plus delta EP. And we know that EK is a half MV squared, so we're going to look at its final phase minus its initial phase. And we know that EP is represented by the formula MGH. So once again, we're going to have MGH final minus MGH initial. We can take our common factors and simplify it. It can work for our success in our calculations. Really interesting formula. The principle of conservation of mechanical energy states the total mechanical energy, that is the sum of the gravitational potential energy and the kinetic energy in an isolated system remains constant. That is such an important definition. You remember from grade 10, this came up for review. So for the principle of conservation of mechanical energy, we use the statement EP, plus EK initial should be equal to EP plus EK final. That demonstrates the principle of conservation of mechanical energy. Now, if the work done by the non-conservative force is equal to delta EP plus delta EK, we need to remember that in the absence of non-conservative forces, the work done by the non-conservative force is zero. Have you got that grade 12s? In the absence of non-conservative forces, WNC will be equal to zero. So to summarize, the work done by a force is always equal to the change in energy. What are we saying? 
W net is equal to delta EK. In a real sense, the work done by the non-conservative force is equal to delta EP plus delta EK. Now, when we use that formula for the work done by the non-conservative force, or the W net is equal to delta EK, the work energy theorem principle, the identification of forces acting on the object is crucial. It is very important. And hence, we are advised to use free body diagrams so that we can calculate things properly. Power is defined as the rate at which work is done or energy is expended. In symbols, this formula is on the formula sheet. P, standing for power, is equal to W, standing for work done or energy. Remember, they're synonymous, work done and energy, over delta T. And there we have the rate at which delta T. So when an object moves at constant speed, we need to use the formula P average is equal to F, that's force, multiplied by the average velocity. That's how we use it. Now, let's go into a calculation because we've itemized, we've underlined, we've revised our very important principles. So let's see how this all plays out. From the November 2020 paper, we have the following interesting question. A roller coaster has a mass of 200 kilograms. They toils at this juncture. What we need to do is we need to make a note of that. Moving across to my page, notice I've made a note. The mass is equal to 200 kilograms because this is the plan that I'm going to use. Remember, plan your work, then work your plan. That's how we do it. So let's go back to our question now. There we have our question. So the roller coaster has a mass of 200 kilograms. With the engine switched off, it travels along track A, B, C in our diagram, which has a rough surface as shown in the diagram below. At point A, which is 10 meters above the ground, the speed of the car is four meters per second. So that's its initial speed, one can say. At point B, which is at the height h above the ground, the speed of the car is two meters per second. So if you compare A and B, we have an initial speed of four meters per second, and there we have uh, at B, a final speed of two meters per second. During the motion from point A to B, 3,40 times 10 to the third power joules of energy is used to overcome friction. Wow, very interesting. We are told to ignore the rotational effects due to the wheels of the car. So, Question 5.1, after we've had a look at the diagram, define the term non-conservative force. I can hear you saying it, Grey Twelves. You are so right. It, the non-conservative force is a force for which the work done in moving an object between two points depends on the path taken. Two marks for you. You've got that definition correct. Well done. Keep it up. Now the next question said, calculate the change in kinetic energy of the car after it has traveled from point A to point B. Once again, remember at point A, which is the initial point, the velocity there was four meters per second. So that's its initial velocity, one can say. At point B, the velocity there, which is its final velocity at point B, two meters per second. So how would we go about that? Well, let's have a look at this itemization. We start by using the formula delta EK. And remember, the question said the change in kinetic energy. The delta EK is equal to EK final minus EK initial. Then if we further 
further unpack this, that's a half mv squared. I'm sure you agree that that is ek in its final format and ek in its initial format. But there's a half and a half here and an m and an m here. So I'm going to take out common factors here. Half m, then what am I left with? Vf minus vi. There's my half. There's my 200 kilograms. You remember the mass of the, of the car, right? The roller coaster car. What is the final velocity? Well, I'm told it's two meters per second. What was its initial velocity? I'm told it's four meters per second. And so when we put this into the calculator, we get the change in kinetic energy as minus 1,200 joules. It's as easy as that, grade 12. Believe it or not, it is easy as that. Notice you start with the formula that you see on the formula sheet, then you substitute into that formula, and then you get your answer. Make sure you put your unit for energy in there as well. Very important. Now, let's go back to our question, and let's see what the memorandum offers. There we have our memorandum, spot on. We got our three marks. So with the definition and the calculation now, already we've got five out of five. We are going to victory. Isn't that amazing? This is truly wonderful. Well done, great folks. Now let's go to question 5.3. 5.3 says, use energy principles to calculate the height H. Now, notice where the height H is. It's there at B. Okay, calls. Notice what I'm going to do. I've got my page here, and I'm going to go across to the visualizer once again so that you can see this nice and clear. There we have my page. Now, let's have a look at this. At H, notice what I'm going to do now. I can use more than one approach, but what I'm going to use now, I'm going to use the principle of conservation of mechanical energy, but in particular, I want to use the work done by the non-conservative force. I can also use the principle of conservation of mechanical energy. There's no doubt about that. However, let me use this formula, W N C is equal to, as you know, delta E K, plus delta E P. Right, that's what the formula states. Now, what's very interesting and why I find that this formula is really going to help me, do you notice this statement here? It says, during the motion from point A to point B, 3,40 times 10 to the third power joules of energy is used to overcome friction. So that is the work done by my non-conservative force. So going back, there we have it. But because the friction is going in the opposite direction of the motion of the car, right? On the track of the roller coaster car, I must put a minus. That is very, very important. And there I have 3, 4, 0 times 10 to the third power. And that's going to equal. Now, great calls. I want to show you something. You see this delta EK here? Does that ring a bell? Oh, yes, it certainly does. You remember from this previous step, there's my delta EK. What did I work this out to be? Minus 1,200 joules. So I don't have to go through this whole rigmarole again. I simply can use the answer here in this particular point here. So what I'm going to do, I'm going to just put this here as minus 1,200 joules. 1,200 joules. Right? That's going to make it nice and easy for me. And then what I do, I'm going to say, look, plus... And delta EP, remember, delta EP literally means I'm going to have my mass G H final, I can say, minus mass G H initial, right? And I'll just put that in brackets because I just don't want that to um, 
you know, confuse anybody. So what I'm going to do now, I can see here, looking at this, that I've got common factors. Can you see I've got an M here and I've got an M here? Can you see I've got a G here and I've got a G here? So in a real sense, this is going to be MGHF minus HI. Okay, right. So where does that bring us? I'm going to move this over. What have I got? I've got minus 3, 4, 0 times 10 to the third power plus 1,200. Right? Remember, when it comes over, it gets plus. And that's equal to, just, I'm just going to write this out so that you see what happens. M, G, and then I've got here, I'm going to use um, square brackets here. I've got H, F minus H, I. Right. Now that's going to make it nice and easy. Let me just get one number here rather than two values. So I take my calculator. I've got minus 3, 4 times 10 to the third power, right? Plus 1,200. What is my answer? The calculator tells me minus 2,200. There I see it. So this is going to be minus 2,200 right here. All right. And that's equal to what is the mass of the roller coaster car? You may remember the mass was given to us as 200 kilograms. Do you remember that? 200 kg. Right. So I'm going to put that in. 200 kilograms. Put that in brackets. What is G? The formula sheet tells us it's 9,8. I am looking for HF. And my initial height, if you go back to the diagram, you'll notice the initial height is here. It's my 10 meters. So let me put that in. Okay. My initial height is simply going to be 10 meters minus 10. Okay. And I put that in brackets. Now, grade 12s, let me find the product of 200 multiplied by 9,8. 200 multiplied by 9,8. Can you see it's 1,960? So what I'm going to say now, I'm going to say minus 2,200 divided by 1,960, 1,960. And then that's equal to HF minus 10, right? And I just put my fraction button there because this mustn't confuse me at all. What I'm going to do now is I'm going to move this minus 10 over, right? And what have I got? I've got minus 2,200 over 1,960, and then I'm going to say plus 10 is equal to HF. Let me see what that becomes. And let me just create my fraction so that this is not a confusing business here. Right, so I've got that. Let me take my fraction button. There's my fraction button. I've got minus 2,200 over 1,960, and then I say plus 10. What is my answer now? There you see the answer, 8,877. So if I round that off, right, my final height, I can declare H final is equal to, let me take this to two decimal places, 8,88 meters, 8,88 Right, that is my final height. Nicely done. Right. Once again, let me go through this with you so that you see in case it came a bit too quickly for you. Right. There we go. What did I do? I started with the formula. The work done by the non-conservative force is equal to delta EK plus delta EP. I recognized that because friction was going in the opposite direction of the movement of the roller coaster car, I must put a negative here because it's in that direction, right? And therefore, this was from the previous step, minus 1,200. We're not going to go through that again because it was already calculated by us here. You remember, there it is here. So I just simply substituted it in there. And then here, this needed some work because delta EP is MGH final minus MGH initial. When I take out common factors, I have this, take that over, 
Eventually, I land up with the situation that will give me a final height of 8,88 meters. Grade 12, do you notice how clear this calculation is? In other words, what you do must make sense. And this is the whole point of physics. You must do what makes sense. It is essential that you remember that principle, right? And write clearly so that whoever is marking your paper clearly sees, oh, this is a fraction, that is a number, it's moving over, and so on and so forth. All right? Very important principles indeed. So let's go and see what does the memorandum offer. All right, it's always good to use that as a sounding board. And there you see the memorandum has various calculations, option one, option two, and there we have notice for option two. You can also use the principle of conservation of mechanical energy. Very good. So the height at B is 8,88 meters. Very important. Now let's go to our next question. Next question has a bit of a statement before it. So let's read this with understanding. Take note, already we've got nine marks. Two plus three plus four. Wow, we are coming so close to getting 14 out of 14 for this question. The next question says, on reaching point B, now remember the height at point B is 8,88 meters. The car's engine is switched on. Remember it was off. We were told in the initial statement. So the car's engine is switched on in order to move up the incline to point C. That's very interesting, right? It's switched on in order to move up. So point C is 22 meters above the ground. While moving from point B to point C, the car travels at five seconds at a constant speed of two meters per second, while an average frictional force of 50 Newton acts on it. So we're given some very interesting information here, all right? So we notice how this whole thing plays out. Then they say, calculate the power delivered by the engine to move the car from point B to point C. Now, grade 12, that is a very interesting and a very easy question to actually work out. What I'm going to do now is once again, I'm going to use the work done by the non-conservative force. So please watch carefully as I go through this. The work done by the non-conservative force, as you know, right, is given by the formula W N C is equal to delta E K plus delta E P. Right, so we've got that. What are the non-conservative forces acting on the system as this? Well, the work done by the engine. We mustn't forget because now the engine is switched on. And also the work done by friction. Yes, the frictional force. All right, we've got that. And we need to talk about that in a moment. And that now is going to equal, as we can see, delta EK plus delta EP. Why are we going this route? Because we actually want to calculate, right? We actually want to calculate the work done by the engine. That's what we are after. Because you see, if we find the work done by the engine, then we can use, we can divide that by the time, and there we can have our answer all very clear. So the work done by the engine, right? Plus the work done by friction. Now let's go back to our question. The question states there, notice an average frictional force of 50 Newton. Ooh, that's nice. So there we have the force. And then what is the displacement, right? What is the displacement? Well, there we have it. 15 multiplied by 15 multiplied by two, and it's in the opposite direction of motion, so we're going to have the cosine principle playing off. 
What are we saying? We are saying the following, right? We're going to have as our next step, we use a different color here. The work done by the engine, right? Plus average force of 15, right? Multiplied by 15, multiplied by two, cosine, and because it's opposite, it's 180 degrees, all right? Because it is opposite of that, it's 180 degrees. Now, the 15, as you can see, we look at our question, there's the question right here, right? There we see it all very clear, right? 15, there we have it, and the two, everything is nicely sketched for us. Very, very nice here. All right, so all we're doing is we're taking exactly what we see in our question and we're putting it into our question. Well, when we do that, now this is going to equal, as we can see, that's going to equal, as we know, when we unpack this, that's going to be um, kinetic energy, right? We know that this is going to be zero, right? Plus, that's the initial. There we have our 200. And then we're going to have our 9,8. You may remember this from the previous step. And then we're going to have our 22 minus 8,88. We just calculated that. All right. So here we have the entire situation sketch for us. When we put this into the calculator, what do we get? Well, let's take our calculator and find out. We've got here 50 multiplied by 15, multiplied by two, and then that's multiplied by the cosine of 180 degrees, which we know is negative one. And that's gonna be minus 1,500, as you can see. So we've got our next step, work done by the engine, right, is minus 1,000. 500. All right. What about this side here? That's equal to. Put our zero there. Zero plus. What have we got here? We've got a bracket 200. Then we've got 9,8. Then we've got 22 minus 8,88. We just calculated that in the previous step. And what do we have here? There we have 25,000. 715,20. All right. So what are we saying now? If we have to find the work done by the engine, therefore the work done by the engine is equal to, we take this 1,500 over. There I have my figure and I say plus 1,500. And the answer is none other than 27,215,20 joules. What are we saying? 27, 2, 1, 5, comma, 2, 0, joules. Right. Now, that is the first step in connection with finding the power of the entire situation, the power of the engine. Now, grade 12, you remember the question said that there was five seconds. So what happens is this. We take this, and I'm going to do two calculations now. I'll tell you why I'm going to do two calculations. All right, so the power by the engine, right? The power by the engine will be equal to the work done by the engine divided by delta T. Okay? That's it. All right, you've got that. What is the work done by the engine? As you can see, remember, 27,215,20 joules. So we write that in. That's equal to 27,215,20. And the time is five seconds, right? Here we go. When we take that, okay? And we divide that fraction button 27, 215, 20. We divide that by 5. The answer is 
5,000 watts. Can you see that? 5,434 watts. So the power of the engine equal to 5,443,04 watts. That's good. That is the correct answer. Now, I want to highlight something here. In this question in 2020, the memorandum, for some reason, did not use five, right? As you look at the memorandum, and you're going to look at it in a moment, the memorandum used 15. Maybe that was just an oversight, but the bottom line is I'm going to do the other calculation here. So we've got the power by the engine, and that's equal to the work done by the engine. Nothing changes in this connection. And delta T, right? Because I know many learners, many of my learners, when working through this particular question, wondered now why is their answer, which was this correct answer, needless to say, why is their answer different from the memorandum? Well, the work done by the engine, as you can see, is 27,215,020. And the memorandum now, for some reason, uses 15 as the time. Right. Memorandum uses 15. We don't know why, but anyway, that's it. Maybe it was an oversight. So the power by the engine, right, is, we take that, fraction button, 27, 215, divided by 15. Answer is, as you can see, 1,000 in here, so that it's nice and clear, 1,814,35 watts. That's the power of the engine. All right, that's that. I've done both of these just to show you, right, what the memorandum got and what the actual correct answer is. This here is the correct answer. This is the correct answer. Because if we use five seconds, that's what the question actually gave us, right? We don't know why there was you, the use of 15 came into place into play here, but that's the story there. So let's go back and now and let's have a look at what the memorandum is actually offering us. When we go back there, now we see exactly, there we have it, and there you see the 15. Can you see the 15 there? There we go. And that is in agreement with what we've got here. I've done both calculations, and there you've seen that that's basically the case. But great class, if this is your answer, you are spot on correct, because the question says it's five seconds. For whatever reason, the memorandum here used 15 seconds, uh, 50, yeah, 15 seconds, we don't know why. But the bottom line is, if 15 seconds is used, that's the memorandum's answer. But if you use five seconds to be faithful to the question, that is your final answer. Did you notice how easy the work energy theorem section is, Great Class? This is truly amazing stuff. In this lecture, we're going to look at question six, which is a Doppler effect. And I'll be hoping you unpack the question so that you'll be able to answer it in a good way when it comes in your final exam. Right. First of all, the question six is on Doppler effect. Usually it's about 10 or so marks. And you need to know the definition. They can say explain what is meant by Doppler effect. So, you Doppler effect is the change in frequency or pitch of the sound detected by a listener because the sound source and the listener have different vessel velocities relative to the uh, medium of sound propagation. Now, if you look at that, there are some very, very important ways that you need to know. The change in frequency, you can see that it's written in bold there of the pitch of sound detected by the listener, right? Uh, because the sound source in the listener have different velocities, right? Relative to the 
medium of sound propagation. And this one is going to give you two marks. So you need to, to remember how to say it's one of the recall questions. Okay. All right. And then right. um, the formula that we use is this is the one that is given at the back, right? So your formula is FL is equal to V plus or minus VL divided by V plus or minus VS times F, FS. And this is how it is given at the back. So when you want to solve problems using Doppler effect, you have to copy it as it is given from the back. So if you want to do to refine the formula, you can always do that later, right? So FL is equal to VL plus or minus VL, V plus or minus VL divided by V plus or minus VS times F of S. And you need to know then that FL represents the frequency of the sounds detected by the listener and it will be in hertz. And FS is the frequency of the sound transmitted by the source, the sound source, it's also in hertz. So wherever you see the F in this formula, it stands for frequency. L stands for listener, S stands for source, and V stands for velocity. And if it is a subscript, VL, V, V on its own is the speed of sound in a specific media. In EA, it's usually 340 meters per second, but it varies. You get it from the question, they will tell you which value to, to use. And VL is the speed of the listener in meters per second, right? And VS is the speed of the source in meters per second. So you can see S is for the source, subscript S is for the source, Subscript L is for the listener, and F is for the frequency. Either we have frequency of the listener or the source, and V on its own is speed of sound in a medium. Usually we calculate in A, and V is a speed of the listener or the source, depending on the, if it's VL, speed of the listener, VS, speed of the sound, source, and all of them should be in meters per second. Right. So in our calculations, either the source or the listener will be stationary. Right. They make it, they, they they will ask you in such a way that either the source or the listener will be stationary. Right. When the source is moving away from the listener, we expect the frequency detected by the listener to decrease. So this now, remember we said, like in this case, we are keep, keeping the listener constant. So we stationary, so we are saying VL is equal to zero, right? And now, if you have forgotten, remember from this formula, you want the FL to be smaller. So you have to divide by a bigger number and you divide by a bigger number if when you add the two that will cause now your FL to be less than FS. So if it's moving away, the frequency or the pitch should decrease. So you divide by a larger, a larger value. That's, that's how you can remind yourself. Okay. And let's see what happens in the next one. Sorry, we just have to go back. Now, if the source is moving, towards the listener. Now, if the source is moving towards the listener, remember and now the frequency detected by the listener, which is FL, should be greater than the frequency uh, that is generated by the source. So you divide by a smaller number. You only get a smaller number if you are subtracting the two. And then it means now this one will be bigger. Uh, sorry, uh, this one will be bigger than the frequency detected by, by the source. So this is how you, you guide yourself when you, are, when you are doing your calculations. Expect that when the source 
is approaching the listener, the frequency should increase. If the source is moving away from the listener, uh, the frequency should 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 decrease like that. Right. Remember from grade ten, uh, wavelength is the distance traveled during a time equal to one period. Right. And the period is the time it takes the wave to complete a single cycle and is measured in seconds. The wavelength is measured in meters and the frequency represented by small f is the number of cycles per second. And the relationship between the frequency and the period is f is equal to one over t and the speed of the wave is f is equal to v is equal to f lambda. This is uh, what you did in grade 10. So in the question, as follow-up questions, they may ask you the applications of the apply effect amounts. So they, these are not, we only gave you three here, but they are even more. So one is measuring the rate of blood flow or blood flow rate of a fetus in a womb, or it's used in outer scan, sound scanning, uh, which is a non-invasive method of diagnosis, or it's used in render for determining the position of a moving object, like uh, in civil vision, right? And then you need to know what is redshift, right? So the spectral lines of light from a distant star are shifted towards the longer wavelength. Longer left wavelength, it means the frequency will be what? It will be low, right? So, so the red shift, you have the frequencies shifted towards the red. Why? Let me go back. Uh, because we want the frequency to be less, so the wavelength will be longer. So the stars, all the stars exhibiting the red shift or red color are moving away from, from the Earth. Okay. Right. We have a, a question here, which is from November 2020. Right. It says here, yeah, a serene of a train moving at constant speed along a straight horizontal track emits a sound with a constant frequency. Okay. The detector placed next to the track records the frequency of the sound. Right. The results obtained are shown as follows, right? So those are your results shown there. Now, state Doppler effect in words. Remember, this is a, a recall question. Uh, where you are going to be given two marks or zero, right? And then 6.2 will say, does the detector record the frequency of 3148 hertz when the train moves towards the detector or away from the detector? So you need to know when the train is moving towards, the frequency is higher. When it's moving away, the frequency is, is lower. Okay, so for 6.1, we will, you see here, according to the Martin criteria, if any of the underlined or keywords, phrases in the correct context are omitted, you will lose one mark, right? So what is underlined there is the change in frequency or pitch. The underlined words have to be there of sound detected by a listener because the source and the listener have different velocities relative to the medium of sound propagation. Okay, so you need to have all the underlined words there for you to get the two full marks, right? Then here, uh, does the detector record the frequency 3148 when the train moves? towards the detector or away, right? If you compare the two frequencies, 3148 is higher than 2073. So it's moving towards, okay. 
let's move on to 26.3 now. Calculate the speed of the train. So here, what we are looking for is, the train is the one that is sounding, a siren. So we are looking for Vs. And take the speed of A to be 340. So this is our V is equal to 340. Like I told you, it's always given in the person, the board of the person, right? So now these are the two that we have. So we are looking for that. Okay. Let's see how we are going to do that. Right. So here, first of all, like I told you, you have to write the equation, the equation as it is given at the back in your formula sheet. You can do the refining when you are about to 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 to, to substitute your values, right? So now here, because here we have a problem, we don't know the frequency of the source. So it's an unknown. So if I may just write here, what we know, we just know V is equal to 340, right? Then we know FL when it's moving uh, towards FL, when it's moving towards uh, is a uh, Three one four eight. That's I just, I just say two, right? And we know FL is two zero seven three when it's moving away. Okay, so that is what we know, and now. Now the, the detector is stationary, so it means VL, VL is equal to zero meters per second. So this is what we know. And what we're trying to find is what VS. But we don't know FS as well, right? So if you list your variables, you see that you've got two unknowns. So definitely you will need to have two equations. One, when the train is moving towards the detector and one, when the train is moving away. So this one is when it's moving towards, right? And this one will be when it's moving away. And remember what I said at the beginning, when it's moving towards, we expect the frequency to be higher, so we divide by a smaller number, so we subtract here. And here it's moving away, we expect the frequency to be lower, so we head down there. So this is what we are going to do. And we substitute, and you can see they're so generous with the marks here. We get one mark here, two, three, four, five, and there are six marks there. So you already have a five months just from writing the equation and uh, substituting into 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 that okay so next then what we have now is you can make fs the subject formula in both and then if you make fx the subject formula then you can equate the two equations because they will be in form of fs fs is equal to but uh we are saying um if the math is too much for you, you can leave it there because already you have five marks. So you don't have to worry because if you take five minutes trying to solve that problem, you're wasting time, which you could have used to solve some other problem. Okay. So then you will get your answer, which is 70 meters uh, per second. And then, as you can see, calculate T1 indicated in the graph above. Is another question which is only only two marks, okay? It, what are you told? The detector started recording the frequency of the train, siren when the train was uh, 350 meters away. So you have delta X, and you know that it's moving in constant velocity, right? Which is you what, what you have uh, calculated here which is your 70 meters per second. So it's not accelerating. So you just need to find the the, 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 the distance that it is 
it is moved there, and you will see that you just see delta x is equal to a delta t is equal to delta x over v, and then you get your your five seconds. Or you can use the whole equation as it is, but remember that the acceleration is zero because it's moving at constant velocity, and still you get your the same answer there. All right. So there's another option number three again. The I and V F are seventy because it's moving at constant velocity, and you know delta x, and then you calculate your time, and you get your twelve marks. Or uh, in this lecture, we are going to look at question number seven, which is electrostatics. Okay, um, you need to know Coulomb's law. It's a recall question. The magnitude of the electrostatic force exerted by one point charge Q1 on another point charge Q2 is directly proportional to the product of the magnitude to the product. Uh, let me just highlight that because uh, some people just don't get it right. Is directly proportional to the product of the magnitude of the charges, right? And inversely, the word is inversely proportional to the square of the distance between them, right? So you need to know that. And please don't use the word indirectly. The word is inversely there, right? It's a recall question. You have to give it as it is given. Otherwise, you lose max unnecessarily. Okay, so, so what this question means now, it means F, Mathematically, when you write it, it means F is directly proportional to Q1 times Q2. Product it means Q1 times Q2 and inversely proportional to 1 over R squared. All right. And obviously, we are going to combine the two. And when we combine the two, that's where we are now going to say F is equal to K Q1 over Q2. Q1, Q2 over R squared, okay. When we remove <clears throat> the proportional sign and put the equal sign and we combine the two, that is what we are going to get there, right? And then that's the equation that will be given at the back and K is a constant, you get it from the constant of the, the table of constant is nine times 10 to the power of nine and we really not, don't worry about the units yet. And when you are using this uh, equation, to calculate the force between two point charges, do not include the plus or minus of the charges because the, from the law itself, the force is directly proportional to the, mag, to the product of the magnitudes of these charges, which means we don't have to put the signs there, right? You should be able to solve the problems using F is equal to KQ1, Q2 over R squared. And remember your R should be in meters and your charges should be, your Q1 and Q2 should be in columns, right? This is one of the questions in paper one where they actually ch check and test to see if you know how to convert your units. They can give you the distance between the charges as millimeters, so you should be able to change millimeters to meters, or as centimeters, you should be able to change centimeters to meters, and they rarely give you your charges in coulombs, they give you in micro, micro coulombs, nano coulombs, you should be able to change the, to change the charges to, to coulombs, right? So, the, in one dimension, they are in this in the same line, right? So what you need to to say to see like yeah, um, and usually we 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 restrict it to three charges, like yeah. So we want to look at the F net on Q two. So our focus is on Q two, yeah, right. So what you need to do is you need to look at and it's minus. 5 times 10 to the power of minus 9 coulombs. So when you're looking at the, at the forces on Q2, you need to, to look at each charge separately. Q1 is positive, so you say, what does Q1 do to Q2? Because 
if this is positive and that one is negative, it's going to attract. So Q2 is going to experience an attractive force towards Q1. And now Q3 is also is positive and this one is negative. So Q3 is going to attract that one. So you now have your forces there. Uh, so this will be your F uh, Q1 on Q2, which is to the, to the left. And this is F Q3 on Q2, which is to the right. And remember, you to assign your, your directions, the, the signs. Right is positive, then left will be negative, or right is negative, then left will be uh, the opposite. And then you add here. And when you do add, you should consider the, the signs as well. The signs, right is positive, left is negative, or vice versa. Okay. Right. Then... So you should be able to solve problems using F is equal to KQ, 1, Q2 over R squared for changes in two dimensions. Now, they are not in the, they are no longer in the same direction now, like that, right? You have three charges and they are arranged like that. So we want F net on Q1 and there is, I'm going to correct that error now. So our focus is Q1 here. So this is plus and this is also plus. So what does Q3 do to Q1? Q3 is going to repel. So you will see that Q1 is going to move this way. It's going to move to the left, right? And this one is negative. Q2 is negative and that one is positive. What does Q2 do? It's going to attract it. So it will be moving like that, right? So that is the, the direction of the force of Q2 on Q1. Let me just uh, label them there. So this one will be F uh, Q3 on Q1. And this will be F Q2 on Q1. So remember, when we have vectors like that, we use a, a to tell. So we have to redraw our diagram like this. If I start with this one, where this one ends, I'll draw the other one. And then my resultant will be from start to end, right? So this is what I'm going to have. And I'm going to have a right angle triangle where this one is now F, a Q3. Q1, and this is F, Q2, and Q1. And this is my F net. And these are at right angles. So it means I am going to use Pythagoras. So I'm going to change this from right, make it right. F net squared is equal to that one squared plus this one squared because it's a right angle triangle. And now we have to use uh, Pythagoras to, to solve that problem. Okay, so, so you use Pythagoras. Let me clear that so that you can see you are going to use Pythagoras now. And I've shown you how you get to that. <clears throat> right. So another focus area of question seven is they can ask you, what is an electric field? An electric field is a region of space in which an electric charge experiences a force. And uh, the direction of the electric field at a point is the direction a positive charge would have moved if placed at that point. So you use the positive test charge to say, okay, in which direction is going to move? If I put it there, then that will be the direction of your magnetic field, the electric field. So for example, here, yeah, this is a positive charge. So what you do is you say, okay, if I put a positive test charge here, right? In which direction will it move? Because this is a positive charge and the post test charge is always positive charge. So this is going to move away. And if I put it there, again, if I put it there, it's 
positive discharge. And so it's going to be repelled and it's going to be pushed away. And that's how we come up with that direction. And everywhere else you can see that the positive discharge will be pushed away from that. And we describe this one as radially outwards, right? We, we describe this, <clears throat> this as radially outwards. So the magnetic field around the positive charge is radially outwards and the magnetic field around the negative charge is radially inwards. Why? Because we are saying if we now put a positive, our test charge is always positive. If we put it here, because unlike charges attract this, is going to be attracted towards that and it will be towards. So this one will be now described as radially inwards, right? It will be ready. And when you draw your magnetic field, your electric field, they should be touching the charge. And you make sure, like, if it is for a positive or negative charge, they are straight lines because they should not cross. If you draw a rough, a rough diagram, they are going to bend and you just extend the lines and you say that they will cross. And remember, there are three marks. The line, one is for the shape of the electric field, and two is for the direction of the electric field, and three is usually for not crossing, so your lines should not cross. All right. So I have already shown you how <clears throat> we determine the direction of the electric field. So the it is the electric field between a positive charge and a negative charge. Remember, for a positive charge, it's away, and for a negative charge, it's towards. So the it is the shape of the electric field, and you make sure that all the arrows are pointing away from the positive charge towards the negative charge. We just need one arrow to be wrong, and then you don't get the direction mark. If they are both positive, we are going to have a neutral point between the, the two charges where there's no magnetic field. This we usually call it the neutral point, but you don't have to talk about it. But you can see that they are repelling each other. And when you draw, make sure that you don't draw something like this because if we extend, you will see that it's crossing. So make sure that even if someone tries to extend your lines, they are not going to cross. So I'm not going to draw. And, and all the magnetic field, the electric fields are going to be touching. I'm not going to draw something like this because that is not, uh, that is not, that is not allowed. And if you extend all these lines, you'll see that they're not crossing anyway, okay? Then if they're both negative, it's just like uh, for the positive, they will repel, we have a neutral point, but what changes is the direction of the electric fields, but the shape remains remains the same. So for the negative, we know that the electric field are towards the negative charge. Okay. Now, remember the first definition was, uh, what is an electric field? Now this is electric field at a point. Right, so you should read your question carefully, which definition are they asking? So if it is electric field at a point, is the electrostatic force experienced per unit positive charge, per unit positive charge placed at that point? You see, this then uh, what I've highlighted is very, very important. So if they say define electric field at a point, it is the electrostatic force experience per unit positive charge placed at that point. And then you will get your, your two marks for the recall question, right? So the E is equal to F over Q, where E is the electric field in, um, in Newton's peculum. And F is your force in Newton's and Q is your charge in Coulomb's, right? And uh, usually people mess up the signs, so I will help you. This one is in Newtons, okay? And this one is in Coulombs. So if my charge is not in Coulombs, I will have to convert. And this one is in Newtons, uh, a, a Coulomb, okay? 
those are the units there. Now they <clears throat> they say now calculate the electric field. You should be able to calculate the electric field at a point due to a number of point charges using the equation uh, e is equal to kq over r squared. That you determine the distribution of the field due to the charge restricted to three charges in in a straight line, one dimension, like that. And again, like I we did with the forces there, you need to look at the uh, a one charge at a time and see its effect on the 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 charge of interest. Okay, let's see. So like here, we need the E net on Q2, right? If I'm looking at Q2, I'll say, okay. Uh, Q2, right? Uh, if I look at Q3, this is positive and this is negative. So uh, we expect it to be in this direction. And that one is negative, uh, positive and negative. It will be in this direction. And you assign your charge. Your you assign your your your, your, your direction positive or negative. A positive to the right, and negative to the left. It's all up to you what you want to do. But be consistent in your directions, right? So. The principle of conservation of charge is another equal question. The net charge of an isolated system remains constant during any physical processes. All right. So Q, final charge after separation. So this is uh, another great chain concept where we have two charges with charge Q1 and Q2. They are brought together in contact, then they are separated. Then after separation, each charge, the, the two charges will have a common charge, which is given by that. And in this formula, you need to include your signs in your calculation. When you're calculating F, no signs. When you're using this formula to find the charge, you need to put your signs, right? And the principle of charge quantization or charge in the universe consists of any multiple of charge or of charge on one electron and Q is equal to QE, where QE is, if we're talking of electrons, it's negative 1.6 times 10 to the power negative 19. When we're talking of protons, it will be positive, right? And these are the equations that are given in your formula sheet under electro electrostatics, right? Uh, your charge should be in columns, and that is the unit symbol and your distance should be in meters. It doesn't matter whether they've given you in millimeters or centimeters, we have to change it to meters. And the electric field, like I said, is in newtons per coulombs and the force is in newtons. Okay, we're going to use that question to look at how we can solve this. Two charges, more two small charges A and B are placed on insulated stands 0 0.2 meters apart as shown in the diagram below. They carry the charge of minus four times 10 to the power negative six coulombs and plus three times 10 negative six coulombs. If they give you in coulombs, you should count yourself lucky and they give you the distance in meters, count yourself lucky. Okay, right now. What we are going to do is now, let's look at the question. M is the point on, is a point that is a distance of 0 0.1 meters to the right of M. Okay, so that there is our M there. As you can see, let me just highlight this is my M, right? So they want you to calculate the number of electrons in excess of A. So here, we are going to use Q is equal to N Q E, right? And this is our Q and Q E is minus 1.6 times N to the power negative 19. And we find we find N and we're going to see, let's just, just confirm that and see what happens there, right? So 
A K E Q is equal to N E, or you can also use it like this. It really it doesn't matter. Q or Q E, it really doesn't matter. It's one and the same thing, right? And then you, this is negative. Remember, we said in this formula, you have to put the sign. So you have to put minus the end. If the big Q is negative, then your small Q will be all, or your E will be also negative so that the negatives can cancel because the number of electrons cannot be negative, right? Let me create that. And then 7.2, calculate the magnitude of the electrostatic force exerted by A on B. Remember, we're using A, K, F is equal to K, Q1 over Q2, Q1, Q2 over R squared. And we don't put the signs here anymore. K is nine times 10 to the power of nine, and Q1 is is negative there, but we don't put the negative. We just put four times 10 to the power of negative six, and that one we don't put a plus. We just put three times 10 to the power of negative six. The distance between them is 0 0.2 meters. Don't forget to square. Most people forget to square here, and you punch into your calculator and get your answer. Right, 7.3. Describe the a uh, the term electric field. Right. So here, it's not talking about electric field at a point. You're just talking about electric field. So electric field is a region in space in which an electric charge experiences a force. Right, uh, you can see electric charge and electric, the electric is put in practice. So you can leave it, you won't lose your marks. But what is required is outlined there, right? Then 7.4, calculate the magnitude of the net force, a net electric field at point Q. Now to, de to determine the direction of the electric field due to a particular charge, you put a positive test charge here and say, okay, if I put a positive test charge here, what does B do? B is positive and that is positive. So it's going to push this one away because they're going to repel, right? And that will be my E, B, right? And then, I now ignore the B and I look at A. A is negative charge and that what, what, what will happen is going to go this way. So E A, that will be my E. E A, right? So E A is to the left and this one is to the right. And I should assign my charges, right? Is positive, left is negative. When I add, because Remember, I'm going to say eventually in it is equal to EA plus EB. So this one will be positive and this one will be negative. Then I add the two. And this is a vector, remember? So I need to state the direction at the end. But here they're just asking about the magnitude. So if they ask about the magnitude, I don't have to worry about the direction in my final answer because they want the magnitude, okay? So let's see how we will attack that problem, right? So E is equal to KQ over R squared and remember the distance now, and in this formula, you don't put the negative here of the charge. The distance now is 0 0.3. For A, is 0 0.3. 0 0.2 plus 0 0.1. That's where you get your 0 0.3 from. And you get that one, and you say it's to the, to the left, right? Why are you putting to the left so that you know the sign when you're adding? If you don't put the direction here, it's going to uh, disturb you when you, you when you add. And then electric fields at M due to B, right? Again, you write the formula and you substitute, you don't put the signs and then you get, it is to the right. And then when you write your E net, formula E net is equal to EB plus EA. And then you remember that the one going to the left is negative and you get your answer. You should have said plus minus, but you need to be 
it doesn't matter and it will be to the right but now here they're asking for the magnitude so you don't have to give the direction anyway right so now 7.4 uh, 7 uh before 7.5 they say charged spheres a and b and another charge sphere d are now arranged along a rectangular system of axes as shown right so the rectangle that they're talking about is if i can just try to show you uh, what they're talking about here is they're talking of uh, this this system here okay so <clears throat> the net electrostatic force experienced by a is 7.9 in the direction shown right in the diagram is the charge d positive or negative remember you need you need to go back and look at this one was negative and this one was positive all right so what could be db you need to find whether it's positive or negative working out on that right so this is the thought process that should happen when you're trying to solve that that equation okay that's that problem so the answer will be it will be positive and why you should be able to explain why it's like that 7.6 now um it wants you to calculate the net force then you are looking at uh, you're looking at the uh, Pythagoras theorem because they are forces acting in two dimensions. You look at the force on in the, the the force of each charge on the charge of interest, and then you calculate your answer. And that is the calculation that comes in. It's a slightly higher order question, but you should be able to do it. In this lecture, we are going to look at question eight, which is electric circuits. Right, the focus areas for question eight, you should know how to state Ohm's laws. Ohm's law, which is uh, one of the recall questions. The potential difference across a conductor is directly proportional to the current in the conductor at constant temperature, right? And mathematically, we write I is equal to V over R or R is equal to V over I. So <clears throat> you need to remember this. And conductors that obey Ohm's law are called ohmic conductors, and those that do not obey Ohm's law are called non-ohmic conductors. And for ohmic conductors, you will see that if you draw your graph, let me just draw here, if you draw a graph of the phases I, you're going to get a straight line passing through, through, through the origin. Let me just undo that one and put a straight line. You will see a straight line that passes through the origin, okay. And let me also label. So this one will be V in volts. This axis will be V in volts. And that one will be I in amps. And what we're going to get is a straight line that passes through the origin. But for non-ohmic conductors, you're not going to get a straight line, okay. All right. Right, you also need to know power. Power is the rate at which work is done and it is measured in watts or joules per second. And you can de deduce the units from there. This is a uh, work in joules and time is measured in seconds. So the units of power will be joules per second or, or in, uh, in watts. So P is P in watts. Or which we use W, have to let it up here to represent that, or those per second. Right. All right. So you need to remember that. And electrically, power is equal to the voltage amps current, or P is equal to VI. And if you make V, 
V in terms of uh, if, if you express. <laughs> okay, so, but we know that, all right, let me just write it here. But, um, but V is equal to pi R. So then you will find, you now replace V with I R here, you get I squared R. Or here you can also use I. I is equal to V over R. And if you do that, then you will get from here, this equation can change to that. If you substitute for I is equal to V over R, then you get P is equal to V squared over R. So you, you choose the, the, the equation to use depending on what you're given. If you're given voltage and current, you use the first one. If you are given current and the resistance, you will use the second one. If you are you given the, the voltage and the resistance, then you can use the, the third one, depending on the question that you're trying to answer. Okay. <clears throat> Remember that <clears throat> kilowatt hour refers to the use of one kilowatt of electricity for, for, for one hour. This is the unit that we use when we are using uh, electric, when ESCOM is charging electricity, they use kilowatt hours. And if you look at that, it's simply coming from, um, because this is electrical energy, it's coming from E is equal to PT. And only that, this one should be in what? This one should be in kilowatts. And this one instead instead of being in seconds, it's in 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 what in hours. Then your energy now will be kilowatt hours. That's where it's coming from. So you convert your power to kilowatts and you turn to hours. Then you can calculate your energy in kilowatt hours. Okay. So to calculate the cost of electricity, given the power specifications or appliances is used during the and the duration and the cost of now you are going to use is equal to PT like I showed you and make sure that the power is in kilowatts and the time is in 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 hours. So it will be the power rating times time times the price. And this one should be or oh, let me just uh, okay. This one should should be in kilowatts now. And this one should be in hours, and then your price it could be in cents or rands, and then you get you get your cost. All right. Right. You need to know e, the EMF is one of the requisites. So in question eight, they can ask you to state Ohm's law or to define EMF, electromotive force. It is the maximum energy provided by a battery per unit charge passing through it. And it's, uh, it's measured in joules. And this is called the second equation. EMF is equal to V load plus uh, V internal resistance, uh, which we can now, V load is I times the external resistance and V internal resistance or small V is I times small R. We are small R is the internal resistance. <clears throat> and um, the real batteries have internal resistance. That's why they heat up when current is passing through, through them, right? So you need to remember the following, the equivalent resistance of resistors in series, you just add the resistors, the individual resistors, RS, stands for resistance in series equivalent. So you are going to add R1 plus R2 plus R3, depending on the number of resistors that you have in the circuit. And the equivalent resistance for resistors in parallel is one over RP is equal to one over R1 plus one over R2 plus one over one over R3. And all these formulas are given 
in your formula sheet. And for this one, people usually make a, a mistake. It's one over RP. And please, just if you are not so sure of yourself, go and have a look at the at the back so that you write the right thing. Okay. So series seconds. All right. A, a, a resistors are connected in series if there is one but for the current to flow. Like I can illustrate here, we have this circuit here. So we have current, let's say current is flowing in this direction. The same current is going to flow through all the three resistors there. And usually we number, number them R1 from the left to right, R2 and R3, like that. Okay. So, and the the V total will be equal to the voltage across individual resistors, right? Let's say, for example, here the voltage is 15. So the resistors, if they're identical, will have 5 volts here, 5 volts, 5 volts. If the resistors are identical, and they have the same, the same value. Okay. Now, let's see. And now what you need to know is the current is the same through so the first bullet tells us the voltage divides and this second bullet tells us the current is the same throughout the three resistors or whatever number of resistors are in series okay for parallel circuits now there is more than one path for the current to flow that's what you need to remember right and you can see here uh, that is the positive the battery if I may show you, this is the positive, and that is the negative. So we expect our current to flow this way, right? And when it gets here at the junction, it's going to split. Some is going to flow through there, and some is going to flow through that other resistor, and the current will meet and continue as one. So that's the difference with this. Here we say the same current is going to pass through all the resistors but here the current is going to split uh, through the resistors there. So the voltage is the same across the, the resistors in parallel. So the voltage across R1 will be equal to the voltage across R2 if they are connected in, in parallel. And the current is going to divide. Like in this case, if we may just use this diagram for illustration. Let's say this is our eye, okay? Let's say this is our eye. Mm, let me, let's say this is our eye here, okay? Which is the current entering the junction. This one will be your I2, and this one will be your I1. And you can see that your I is equal to I1 plus I2. In this case, your I is equal to I1 plus I2, because there are only two branches in this in this circuit, right? But the voltage across R1 and R2 will be the same. We are just using this one as R1 and this as R2, okay, like that. Right, let me clear my diagrams. <clears throat> Right, adding resistors in series. All right. When you add resistors in series, the total resistance increases. And the other thing that you can use to remind yourself is if resistors are in series now, the effective resistance will be greater than the largest. Effective resistance. Uh, is greater than largest resistance. In series, okay. Right, there's an effect uh, that you should just remember that will help you. And then <clears throat> this is our second equation, okay? So we're saying, if we add resistors in series, the uh, 
the external resistance will increase, the total external, external resistance will increase, that's effect. And then uh, the total current will decrease. Right. <clears throat> In case you are not following, why do we say that we can make the current the subject formula from that equation? Right. You will see that it will be E over R external plus the internal resistance. Right. So we are increasing this one. Remember, your EMF is constant. So if we increase this one, means the current is going to decrease, right? So the total current in the second loop will decrease and the V internal will decrease, right? So we have the current that is decreased, okay? If we go back to this equation, the second equation, we have this current that is decreased, the current that is decreased here. So this one is constant. So it means this is going to decrease. Your, your, your V, this is your small V, by the way, it's going to, it's going to, to, to decrease, which is the V internal resistance, all right. Let's move on and see what happens now when, so the V load will increase, okay? That is okay. Why? Because this whole thing is decreased and this one is constant. So this I R external should increase for the current to remain to remain the same. Right? Adding resistors in parallel, what does it do? Now the total resistance in parallel will decrease. So now the effective resistance here will be less than. Okay, let me just type it for you. When you do that, the effective resistance is now less than the smallest resistor, you know, parallel. And it will help you uh, when you're calculating as well. This will guide you so to make sure that you you are doing the right thing. Okay, so that is a fact that is going to happen there. Now, let's see what is the next fact there. The total current will increase now. Why? Because the the effective resistance has decreased, so the current will increase. All right. So if we go back to our equation again, we will try to make I this is the formula to prove that fact. So we're saying I is equal to EMF, which is constant over R external plus R internal resistance. So because we've added a resistor in in, uh, in in parallel, this one is going to decrease. When this one decreases, Remember, this one is constant. It means, and the EMF is constant, so your current is going to to increase. That's why we're saying the total current is going to increase here. Yeah. And if you go back there, if this means your your total current increases, right? So your if V internal increases, and therefore your V load will decrease. If you can follow, if you look back at the, the equation there, right? So the V internal will increase because of the increase in current and the V load will decrease because the, of the increase in uh, V internal resistance. All right, let me clear these notes. Okay. Now, possible graphs of Ohm's law, right? They can give you current versus voltage and if they give you current bus result voltage here remember your 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 is now current versus voltage right so the gradient here which is your slope your m will be equal to one over r because they put i is the is the is the 
as a dependent variable and the voltage is the independent variable. But if they put V on the y-axis and I on the x-axis, your gradient will straight away give you your, your, your resistance, right? So or they can also give you the V internal, uh, this graph of V versus I, uh, which will give you the internal resistance and the EMF. And this is, uh, if they've made V this of the formula, so we can actually see, let's work it out and see what we're talking about. So we know E is equal to V plus uh, is more R. I'm writing it like that because they put V here. So I'll make V the sub of the formula. V now is equal to minus IR plus the EMF. And I'm writing it like this because they put I there, right? So I can just rearrange here and say minus R, just changing the order plus E, because I want to compare it with the equation of a straight line, is equal to mx plus a C, right? Why? Because V is on the y-axis and I is on the x-axis, right? So mathematically, it means now your gradient, which is your M, is equal to minus R, of which R is the internal resistance, right? So if you want your internal resistance is equal to uh, minus the slope. This is one of the uh, prefer prescribed experiments anyway that you did in term three. And if you look at this now, your y intercept, which is happens to be on the v-axis here, is equal to to e, which is the EMF of the cell. So you just read it straight, and you are going to get a straight line. Uh, if you plot v against i with those attributes, okay. So I can I can actually clear this. Now let's go to the next. Right. These are the formulas that are available in the back in your formula sheet to help you with this question. Question 8, the electricity. All these are uh, formulas that you can use and they are available. And all the physical quantities here, you need to remember that current, we use I, not A. A is the unit there, which represents the empire, and the electrical energy is measured in joules, and power is in watts or joules per second. I think I've uh, said that before. So this one all in joules per second, all right? And resistance is measured in ohms, potential difference. And here we can also add EMF. They're all measured in volts, okay. So you need to 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 remember this, right? Here we've got a question, a typical question number eight. Let me just go back. Okay, uh, it's for November twenty twenty. A battery with an internal resistance of zero point five and a non EMF is connected uh, to three resistors. Right, and you can see the three resistors, one, two, three, and this one is inside the, the battery. That's why you see that 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 shape there, that rectangular enclosing the R with the with the with the E inside. Okay, so and usually the resistance of the connecting wires should, should be ignored for our calculations to be easy. There is um, that recall question that you need to remember, define EMF of the battery. Okay, first of all, before we go there, you can see that these two resistors are in parallel. R2 and R3 are in parallel, and they are in series with R1 and the internal resistance. So then this is the analysis that you need to know. So when you have a current flowing now, it means uh, this is the positive of the cell and the negative. So the current flows in this direction. When it gets here, your current is going to split. 
And usually for calculation purposes, we can call this I2 because it's passing through R2, R2. And you can call this R3 because it's passing through there as well. And then the current will meet at that junction and continue as, as R right. Let's let's see now how you would uh, answer that. Define the term EMF. Remember, we gave it at the beginning. Uh, EMF and the marking criteria. If any of the underlined words in the or phrases in the correct context are omitted, you will lose one mark. Okay. So the context must be right. So you need to say the maximum energy provided by a battery per unit charge or per column. Per unit charge or per column means the same thing because charge is measured in columns anyway, passing through it. Then you get your, your two marks there. Then eight, number 8.2, give a reason why the voltmeter rating decreases. Where is it coming from? The rating on the voltmeter decreases by 1.5 when the switch is closed. Remember, we said the battery offers resistance to the flow of charge, right? So it's due to energy is converted to heat in the battery due to the internal resistance of the battery and you get your two marks then 8.3 calculate the following when the switch s is closed so when s is closed it means the current is now flowing because we have closed the, the switch there right so calculate the reading of the ammeter we want to find the reading the ammeter here. Remember, we said the current that flows through here is the current that flows through here again, and is the current that flows through the the internal resistance. And we know now that a V loss, a V or or V internal is equal to one point five because that's the amount by which the voltage decreases when we switch on, which is this is the one that is converted to heat in the batteries. So we know that and we know, and remember this V internal is equal to I small R, right? So we know this and we know this. So definitely we can cal calculate current from that relationship. And that's why we say V is equal to I R. And we are using the internal resistance here though they didn't write it using the subscript, but that's where it's coming from. Okay, then you get your three marks there. Then um, 8.3.2, calculate the total resistance of the circuit. Like I said, you need to see that these are in parallel. So you need to find the power resistance first before you do anything, right? So these two in parallel are the ones that you calculate like that. And you got to get the uh, parallel resistance first. 1 over Rp is 1 over 1 plus 1 over 2, and you get the answer. Don't rush. And again here, don't round off this one to two decimal places. It's not your final answer. It's wise to work four decimal places within a calculation and you only round off your final answer. Now, remember, this is in series with R1. Then you can add the R1 there, and that will give you the effective resistance, the total external resistance of your cell. Okay. Now, let's see the next question that comes. Oh, you can use this one. This one is when you work the formula using fractions, then it's product over sum. And you can also, though the formula is not given, you can, you can use this one and get the same answer anyway. All right. 8.33 now says you calculate the EMF of the battery. Now, we now know the current that flows through. We now know Rx external, which is the, the effective resistance of the three seconds, and we know the current flowing through there. So we can just write the second equation e is equal to I in brackets R plus more R. And then we know everything. We have calculated the current. We just calculated the R big R, which is the external resistance and small r is given and we substitute and we remember the units of emf are folds you then you get your answer or someone could have instead of using this formula you could have used the voltages there because this one is given as 1.5 and that when you find it by calculation and you also get the same answer right then 8.4 elena makes the following statement the current through 
if they resist R3 is larger than that of R2. Okay, this one is a smaller resistance and that one is a bigger resistance, right? Remember the larger the current, the, the larger the resistor, the smaller the current. So we expect more current to pass through R3 than R2 when it divides, when it gets there. So the answer is yes. And for the same voltage, why we say that because the voltage is the same for those two resistors because they are in, in parallel. So a larger current will flow through the small resistor and you can use that formula to explain your answer. O I is directly proportional to one over R and then O yes, I is directly proportional to one over R O I is inversely proportional to R or at constant V, then you get your, your mark. Then 8.5 says the four ohm resistor is now removed. Right. So how will this affect the EMF of the battery? Right. The EMF is the maximum okay, energy supplied there by the battery per unit charge passing through it. So it is not going to be affected by the change in the resistance in the circuit. So that's why the answer is remains remains the same. Okay. In this lesson, we'll be looking at question number nine, G, which deals with electrodynamics. Okay. So you need to understand that a generator converts mechanical energy or kinetic energy into electrical energy, and the motor does the opposite, right? And as the Faraday is low, the electromagnetic induction, a yeah, low uh, electromagnetic induction, whenever a conductor moves inside a magnetic field, there will be an induced current in it. And Fleming's right hand pull, is also known as the dynamo row is used to determine the direction of induced current. So you remember there's Fleming's left hand row and Fleming's right hand row. The easiest way to remember is the right hand row is for the generator. You can hear the right and right and you and generator. That will help you remember. And the left hand row, you can talk here in R they so you use it for the motor. Okay, so you are going to stretch your, your thumb, your first finger and second finger at right angles to each other as shown there. Some prefer using the FDI, F for the thumb to represent the force and B for the magnetic field and I for the current. Or some actually prefer using uh, the thumb, okay, T for the thumb. Uh, to represent your thrust or, or force, right? And your first finger, your first finger, uh, you use it to represent your, your field, okay? Which is your magnetic field in a way. And then your second finger. So the first finger is that one there, and your thumb, right? And the second finger, the second, we take the C from second finger. Uh, we use a term, which is this one. We use it to represent the current. So it's all up to you what yeah, makes you comfortable or what makes it easier for you to remember. So the thumb, we can say thumb thrust, or you can use also the M from thumb for the motion of the wire, it's all up to you. Or you can use FBI, the first finger, you take the F from the first to represent the field, and the second finger, you take the C from the second to represent your, your induced current, right? Then 
alternating the two types of generators. We've got the alternating current generator and the coil is connected to the slip rings. And please, you need to know the difference again. And this one is connected to the slip rings, right? And the, in a direct current or DC generator, the coil is connected to the split ring split. It's, it's split is a, a half ring, which is a split, right? And this one is a continuous ring, right? This one is a split ring, like that, right? So that's the difference between the two. And the current in the external circuit changes direction for the alternating current. Alternating means changing. And in the direct current generator, the current in the external circuit does not change direction. It remains, it flows in one direction, right? even if the coil is rotating. Those are some of the things that you just need to know when you're answering this question. It's about nine to 10 marks, right? And <clears throat> let's look at, on the AC generator. The direction of the induced current changes with every half chain of the coil, reversing again after the coil moves through the vertical position, okay? So all the time your current is going to change direction and remember here your magnetic field is from uh from 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 north to south always right uh, your coil in a generator is rotated mechanically like uh, in hydropower electric uh, stations the coil is rotated by falling water all right or oh, in thermal power stations, the coil will be rotated by pressurized steam, right? So then that causes the coil to cut the magnetic field. And once we have the change in magnetic flask, then we are going to have an, an EMF being induced in the coil, right? So this type of current is called alternating current because it changes direction and magnitude, all right? And that is the type of the waveform that you are going to get. And it will be zero. It will be maximum when the coil is horizontal, as you can see here. And AB is that part of there. And it will be zero when the coil is vertical, right? Because when the coil is vertical, it will be moving parallel to the magnetic field lines, not cutting them. So we expect a current of zero there. And at 180, again, now you can see A is on the other side. It has flipped over. It's A and B have changed position. So we get maximum in the negative direction or in the opposite direction and like that, like that. Okay. So in a DC generator, okay, again, our coil is going to be rotated manually and still our magnetic field is from north to south. And now the split ring commutator ensures that the direction of the induced current does not change. It remains the same, flowing in the same direction. So one of the brushes here is permanently positive and the other one is permanently negative, like in this scenario. We'll see that it's like this. Okay. All right. Then let me just clear this. Right. And this type of current is called direct current. Direct current it means it's restricted to one direction and in the actual sense, direct current should be flowing in one direction and have one a, a constant value, but ours is not going to have a constant value, as you can see from the waveform. So again, our our induced voltage or current will be maximum when the coil is horizontal, and it will be zero when it's vertical because the brushes here in the commutator will be in line with the gaps. In the in the in the split ring, so 
nothing is going to be induced there, then and you can see that it's restricted to one side, but it doesn't go all the other all the other side. So the induced current is always in the same direction in the external circuit. Okay. So now the opposite of a generator is a motor. So in a motor now, remember in a generator, we say the mechanical energy is converted to electrical energy. Now in a motor, electrical energy is converted to mechanical energy is the direct opposite now. So there in the generator, we're moving the coil mechanically. But now here, what's going to happen is the motor is based on the motor effect where the current carrying conductor in a magnetic field experiences a force. So the fact that the coil is carrying a current uh, within a magnetic field, it will experience a force. And from what we said earlier on, now because it's a motor, you're going to use Fleming's left and the row. The thumb still will represent the, the thrust in the first finger, the field, and the second finger is your, your current, right? Or you can still use the FPI thumb force, first finger B field, and second finger I the current, all right. So Fleming slipped and motor is used to determine the direction of the magnetic field or the current or whatever, right. Now the difference is now we are using the left hand row instead of the right hand row, but still the thumb, the first finger and the second finger still represent the same thing, all right. Then now, uh, we also are required to know the root mean square, the root mean square potential difference, which is VRMS, is the AC potential difference, which dissipates or produces the same amount of energy is an equivalent DC potential difference. All right. And your VRMS is a constant value by the actual waveform is follows a sine wave that is you can see here right so that one the vrms we can say loosely speaking is the average value that we will, we will get from an ac current so vrms you don't have to worry about this formula it's given vrms is equal to v max over root two. so your v max is the peak it's also known the peak voltage or the maximum voltage right so, and you should be able to rearrange that formula, right? You can also rearrange it if you want Vmax. It means Vmax will be equal to uh, uh, VRMS times root two. Okay. So if you're given VRMS, that's how you are going to get your Vmax. Okay. Uh, the root mean square current, which is IRMS, is uh, the alternating current which dissipates the same amount of energy as equivalent DC current. Okay, those are two recall questions. They can ask you any one of them in the exam. Okay. Now, so the current also follows the sine wave like that, and. The IRMS is equal to IMAX over 2, and you can also make IMAX the subject of formula. Uh, baby, baby. So your IMAX will be equal to IMAX will be equal to uh, IRMS times root 2 or two IRMS, but uh, be careful when you do this, you just know that the IRMS is not under the square root, right? It's not under the square root side. Be careful when you do that, right? You can write it like that, okay? Now, let me respond to that, it's a P average. Purely resisti resistive circuits can be calculated using VRMS and IRMS. All right. Remember, we already know from our grade 10 and 11, P is equal to VI. Right. 
So when we talk of uh, P average, we have to use the RMS values. So, and when you're using this formula, please put the subscripts. If you don't, if you just write it like that, you are not going to get the formula. So, and we also know that P is equal to uh, V squared over R from what we've done before. So when we're talking of P average, it means now your P average will be equal to, remember we talk of RMS, but there's no RMS resistance. We only talk of RMS voltage and and current value by that, which is what you're getting there, right? Perfect. Right. Remember the subscripts because if you don't put the subscripts, you won't get your your answer mark, your your formula mark. Okay, we've got a multi question here, which is November twenty two. A simplified uh, diagram of an electric machine exchange. So you see now. This is connected to a power source, right? If it is connected to a power source, now it means it is a it is a motor. And on the motors, you will find motors almost everywhere. You'll find your motor in your hair dryer. It's a motor you find in a microwave with the one that turns the, uh, the plate. You find the wall, my the motor in your fan, you find the motor in your DVD player that turns the disc, you find the motor. In on in your electric gate, uh, the, the motor is almost everywhere. Okay, so because of the power source, they start asking: Is this machine a DC or motor or DC generator? So remember, we said a generator is going to convert mechanical energy to electrical energy, but this one is already connected to electrical energy. That makes it a what a motor. Okay. Let me clear this. All right. So our answer, like we said, is a DC motor, right? And then write down the energy conversion that takes place in the machine, the machine while it is in operation. Remember, a motor changes electrical energy to mechanical or kinetic energy. So electrical to mechanical or kinetic energy, and it's two max or zero for that one. All right. I write down the name of the component A, right? It's a split ring commutator. You can see it's split in half, so it's a split ring, okay? But then in which direction will the motor, will the coil move, right? Here, what you need to do now is you need to, okay? Uh, you need to put the direction of the current. You know that it's always from positive to negative through the external circuit. So in the coil, your current is flowing like this, right? So that's one thing that you need to do. And then you need also to put your magnetic field, right? Magnetic field, you know that is always from north, north to south, right? That is your magnetic field, your magnetic field this from north to south and now since it is a motor you are going to use Fleming's left hand row right so with your with your second finger pointing from north to south uh, with your first finger pointing from north to south and your second finger pointing away from you and you will see that uh, if you do it properly this Guy should be moving down, and that part should be moving up like that. And if it's moving like that, and you can see now, the direction of motion will be like that. Okay. Let's see. So the answer will be anticlockwise, like I just showed you the using Fleming's left hand rule, right? And nine point two. An electrical device is max 200 uh, watts and 220. From the units, you can see that this is the power rating and this is the voltage rating, right? Uh, define RMS voltage is a recall question. 
is the AC voltage or potential difference which dissipates the same amount of energy as an equivalent DC potential difference. Okay, two max or zero. Calculate the resistance of the device. So you this one thing that you just need to remember is this rating they give you. If it is the power, it is the P average. If it is the voltage that they give you, it is the VRMS. If, if it is the current that they give you, it's the IRMS. Once you know that, then after a few problems are solved. So we have got P average and VRMS. So we are looking for the resistance of the device. So we can use P average is equal to VRMS squared. You always use what you have it's safer that way than try to calculate something so that you can go on and calculate the rest. It's better to use what you already have, right? So you see P, V, R, M, S. P average is going to be R, M, S over R, and then substitute what you already have and you calculate your R. Option number two, you could also try to find the current I, R, M, S first, then you use uh, v R M S over I R M S to give you R and then you get your answer. But if this is a long way, you can straight away go through the end. You can also use that one. And then when you find your I R M S, use P I R it is equal to I R M S squared or times R, then find you R. And it's one of the questions that we have uh, so many answers depending on the method that you use. Okay. So we have an answer for a particular method that you, you have used, right? And now this device is now connected to 150 volt AC source. Calculate the power dissipated in the device in 10 minutes. Remember our time should be in seconds before you do your calculation. So, and again, you can, Use W is equal to V squared because you're given a V and delta T, you're given T and R, which if you just calculated and you calculate that. Or let's you can also use P is equal to W over delta T. You first of all calculate your power average. You always use power average, you calculate your power average there, and then you calculate. And your 10 minutes, remember you need to convert to seconds. That's why you multiply by what? You multiply by 60 to make it uh, into seconds. And then you, you get your answer like that. And there's so many options that you can follow. They depend on what you want to, but I prefer you using what you are already given uh, so that you minimize the steps, the more the steps that you make, the, the higher the chances of making mistakes. Great class, we know you can do this. Remember, on the MNED website, there are other examples and videos that you can consult to consolidate your preparation for Physical Sciences Paper 1. We want you to do well in Physical Sciences, and we know that you're working very, very hard. So please, grade 12, do everything you can to ensure that you do well and that you really concentrate and accelerate your efforts in preparing for your final exam. All the very best. Don't give up. Don't give in. Plan your work. Then work your plan.